intimately familiar, even as, as far back in the beginning, uh, Auntie Dorothy Cordova and uh, Dr. Ron Villanueva. Uh, no, Ron. Ventura, excuse me. <laughs> wow, what a slip up. Um, at this point, I'll just, uh, uh, if, if, if the audience out there has had a chance to read the bios of both Auntie uh, Dorothy and, and Ron, uh, uh, please do so um, before they actually begin. Uh, it's actually uh, it's interesting that uh, Auntie Dorothy has, has uh, started this way, way, way back, probably when uh, I was more, in, uh, probably, well, yeah, in the 60s. <laughs> elementary school so without uh this without uh butchering uh this anymore i'm just gonna go forward and, and we'll just go from there all right thank you max okay and um this is our everybody should have a copy of this uh this is uh, our handout for today and uh, i'll just kind of scroll through this whole thing um, Emily was going to talk about the Fawns auction, which is happening right now. So you could click on this. This is our fundraiser. So hopefully you guys could click on and and bid on you know certain items that of interest to you. And make sure your bids are high, okay? Because this is like one of our few major fundraising activities that we have throughout the year. But uh, kindly uh, thumb through some of the uh, the the auction items. As a matter of fact, they had an auction item of, of face masks, and they had one on five of them. <laughs> Um, the University of Washington, that's my alma mater. And so uh, I, I put in a bid for a hundred bucks. So hopefully that, that holds up, but hopefully it does not hold up and somebody <laughs> puts in 150 bucks. So hopefully uh, you guys um, uh, put, in some, put in some money and donate to our cause. Um, then you guys are familiar with our Fawns Legacy Month. Uh, this is our 30th anniversary as far as Fawns Hampton Roads is concerned. The Legacy Month and Fawns Now our, our gifts to funds to keep the organization relevant and thriving for our future. Uh, then you could thumb through this, uh, our funds youth summit, which occurred October 12th, 1997. That seemed like yesterday. And that's when Dan Fontemir was a high school student. So uh, these are pretty thought provoking uh, a method on how to teach history to high school kids. Uh, instead of straight up lectures and stuff like that, which Peter Boccio and Alex Fabros failed miserably, uh, we had to think of a way to do it. And the way we did it was to uh, do some uh, skits, dramatizations, spoken word, because you have to know the history in order to perform it. And so our history comes alive with these dramatizations. And I'm very, 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 very proud of these East Coast high school students that under the tutelage of Ray Obispo, who took ownership of that whole new program back then. Um, the Proclamation of Virginia Beach, this is for all you in, in areas uh, to use, you know, to copy. And uh, hopefully you could have that in place for your specific city or town, but you could use this to copy. Fonz membership, uh, we're, we're getting better. We're getting better because on, on my last, when, I, when we first did this, we have a, a statistic saying how many people uh, answered no, are you a member of Fonz? And in the very beginning, there was like maybe 50% were FONS members. And now the percentages are going down. And I'm glad to announce that it's down to 10% are not members of FONS. And we're giving a discount. $20, you could become a member in the year 2020. So hopefully next time we air, it's going to go down to 5%. So please, please, please invest in our people and invest in this chapter because if, after all, if you become a FONS member, Hampton Roads, you have access to our lively meetings. And I guarantee it will be lively. Now, these are the past <laughs> programs that we've had, our land, our home, our story. Thank you to P.O. Decano and um, Lorena Bookset. Um, no History, No Self, our icon, historian, educator, uh, past president, Mel Orpelia. Um, you know, he did the presentation. You have a copy of the, uh, the presentation outline, uh, but you don't have a copy of the recording because you have to be a FONS member now to receive <laughs> Mel's recording. Um, last week, we had the, uh, the literature, Filipino American literature. You have, a, you, you have the uh, presentation outline, and now you guys also have the recording. So um, 
you look it up. It's all there. You guys all have it. Today is We Are Fonz. Next week, we're going to um, feature the Cultural Center of Virginia, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Then on the 27th, um, we're going to produce this program called When Virginia Wasn't for Lovers. Then um, we're going to have a real special one on the 29th. We fought for freedom, Filipino-American Vietnam veterans. Now, I want you guys to Google Filipino-American Vietnam veterans. You'll find nothing. Nothing's on them. And that's a tragedy. But Fonz is bringing it alive. Their, their voices are starting to become heard. And so uh, on the 29th, I encourage you if, you, if you're curious about how come all of a sudden they decided to speak up, to tell their story, this is your opportunity. Then we're gonna conclude the whole month with the court case that I did, Bergana versus the city of Virginia Beach. Well, if this is supposed to be a month on devoted to activism, this is it right here. I had to learn all the lessons that was passed down to me from day one my, when my father set foot back in the 1920s. I, I worked with the Alascaros, the Monongs, under the gui guidance of Uncle Mike Castellano, Dorothy and Fred Cordova. I put all those lessons to hand and I beat the man. Anyway, continuing on, here's a real nice uh, history uh, outline that you guys have. I have all these articles on, on the history. Um, I put these articles on the union, which Peter Boccio uh, uh, covered in his readings. And here's some on Seattle. And here's a special one for you guys here, the Fonz National Archives. It's a little video as far as what the archives looks like back in Seattle, okay? Uh, then I included for, for today are these three separate videos that I, that I put together with Auntie Dorothy. This was before we were going to, to Chicago. So usually when I co go to Seattle to visit, the Fonz National Office is like always one of my first stops before Dix sometimes. And if you guys don't know Seattle, Dix is the famous, famous hamburger <laughs> place. But sometimes I'd, I'd skip Dix to go see Uncle Fred and Auntie Dorothy. And we sit down and just start talking. And so it's nothing made up. It's just something that I think is it's very, very, very informative. It's it's non, you know, it's all impromptu, and uh, it's very, very, very uh, worthy to see and, and and hear from from Auntie Dorothy behind before the makeup. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> anyway, and then uh, go ahead and read these bios. Uh, we're going to attempt today. We're going to attempt today to start talking about the history of our own organization, Fonz. Um, we're going to be we're going to be celebrating our 40th anniversary in the year 2022. The conference will be in Seattle. I encourage everybody to come. Although we have you know this virus thing you know um, to deal with, but uh, the Seattle chapter under the, the 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 leadership of the dynamic little sister of mine. Barbara Regano has taken upon the task to put together this uh, fine conference that I know that she needs volunteers and um, hopefully you uh, contact her. Uh, and so in the, in attempt to start gathering and telling the histories, I decided, uh, okay, we'll start off by the conferences because the national conferences has been like one of the favorite events that happens every two years where we all get to gather together and um, and just you know bond, uh, exchange uh, ideas, meet new people, try to understand each other from different parts of the country. You know the research that's being done. It's a tremendous opportunity to meet kindred spirits because uh, we are the the, the 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 heart and soul. I like to call ourselves of the Filipino American people because if 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 you if you don't know the history, then you don't know who you are, and if you don't know who you are. You're going to answer to anything, right? So today we're going to have two people that's very, very valuable in trying to disseminate, you know, share, collect, you know, the history. We have our, our fearless founder, Dorothy Cordova, and now Dr. Ron Buenaventura. Now, Dr. Ron, you guys don't understand the role he's played in Fonz. And so why Ron is going to be... Uh, you know, featured today. Well, 
There's a lot of stuff that goes behind the scenes that people just don't know when it comes to putting on a conference. And Ron has put up not just his time, his money, his energy, his love, his support to keep our conferences in the black. I should say in the brown, which means we don't know anybody anything. So we're glad to have Ron. Um, we're going to pose the question to Auntie Dorothy. Um, uh, what are the memorable moments from the 18 past uh, uh, national conferences? And then uh, over here we have notes on the Bonds National Conference. When you scroll there, you're going to have other people write about their personal uh, perspectives, and uh, they'll be able to chime in, and hopefully um, we'll get this thing uh, going on the right track. Uh, then we, uh, the Dreamland, this is the uh, organization that's uh, trying to put together a series of, of videos or videos or, or uh, series, a documentary series on Filipino American history, and you guys have access to this, and uh, hopefully Ron will, will speak as far as how you could donate you know, for the cause, because we have Claire Miranda of, uh, of Dreamland, who's, who's there to support us. So, the one thing that I wanted to make clear today too, and I assure Auntie Dorothy, that uh, there is no time limit. We don't have a stress of one hour. We're gonna relax, I want people to relax. This is a rare opportunity that you get to hear history by the maker of the history. And we're talking about Auntie Dorothy. So Auntie Dorothy, without <laughs> further ado, let's see if I could do this. Let's see. Oh, did I switch screens okay, Dan? Can people see the new uh, thing up here? Yeah. Yes? I can't tell. I can't see anything. It's there. Yes, I, I see the slide. Okay. I don't see. Can you see it now? No, I don't. No, I don't see the slide. Sorry. Oh no. <laughs> anyway. Good. Okay, now I do. Okay, good. Thank you, Damien, for kicking the machine. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, entitled our national conferences. Now, you guys have access to this too. So, in case you guys, you know, can't see the slides, you guys will have copies of it and just sit back, kick back, re listen and you know, enjoy yourself. So, Auntie Dorothy, can you see the slide now? And you could start. Auntie Dorothy? Yeah, on you. I... Go ahead, Auntie Dorothy. Okay. Um, actually, I should tell you, I'm not going to go with the pictures only. The pictures are just for you. Um, I'm going to the, um, the conference is started on a challenge to me. Um, in 1986, I asked, the, I told the trustees, we should start sharing the history that we've collected with the NEA trans, some of the research that was in the office. And um, some of the people thought, well, who's going to come? And I said, well, we will just try to start it. And so they said they, they didn't back me. So Mom, I decided we would you. do it anyway. Mom, they can't hear you. You're on mute. Pardon me? You're on mute. They can't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can yes. hear you. Now you can hear me. Okay. So I asked a student, Emily Lawson, if she would help me get together a conference. And then Fred wrote uh, some publicity uh, stories to put in the Philippine news and the local Filipino newspapers. And um, I was amazed uh, with that little bit of preparation, which only took around four or five months, uh, a little under a hundred people came to the very first one. I'd written a plan to bring in two people who are very important, Marina Espina, who did the research on Filipinos in Louisiana, and also, um, a young woman in uh, Los Angeles, Linda Mabalot, 
who was the, the director of an Asian agency that was collecting uh, historical photographs of the Asian American community. And we had different speakers. First, we had, what got me was it was truly national because we had people from Los Angeles, uh, Helen Brown, uh, two from uh, Chicago, Australia, uh, Alamar, and Barbara Sutton, her husband, uh, uh, Thelma Buckholt from Alaska, and um, uh, people from San Francisco, uh, including Oscar Peñaranda, and one fellow whose name I forgot, but he did a presentation on Filipino Grima. And what was interesting is every but the few people who presented during that conference, the theme was who, what is a Filipino? What I wanted to do to start with the whole premise is how do we determine who, who are we as a Filipino American? Are we more Filipino? Are we only American? Or are we a combination of the two? So the conference pretty much tried to address that. And um, it was only a day and a half, but it was a success so much that people wanted to know if we could have the second one. And Marina Spina said, yes. What came out of that conference besides knowing that we could carry it on, and we didn't go in the hole, we, we were in the black. Um, the first chapter came, uh, Lourdes Markley uh, came to us and said, could we start a chapter in Oregon? And that was because she had attended this conference. Now, just to uh, an aside, there are only three people who have attended all the conferences so far. That's Emily, Lourdes Markley, and me. Uh, since Fred died, of course, he hasn't been around. But um, so that was the beginning of the whole thing. It was a whole thing of you have an idea, don't let loose of it, just go for it. And it told us that there were people out there who were interested. The people who came from all the different parts of the country had different stories to tell. And it was a matter where we were now continuing the whole premise of Juan, which is to collect, document, and especially share. And we were starting a tradition. The next conference is in Saint uh, in New Orleans. That's Seattle. And those are some of the people at the Seattle conference. Um, besides Emily, we had people, my old staff people, like my sister Jeanette, working at the table. Okay, so St. Louis, I mean, in... Um, went to New Orleans and it was interesting because Fred had a stroke right before this, uh, the New Orleans uh, conference. He was, we were in California for at least three weeks and he was supposed to be the keynote speaker. And Marina and I were really, we didn't know what was gonna happen. She was working on it. I was working from Seattle. She's working on it uh, from uh, Louisiana. But Fred was given permission to go and give the, um, give the keynote, the doctor said it's okay to keep them uh, silent. There was a scholar we brought, uh, an older fellow, uh, Trinidad Rojo, who was a real scholar. And um, I made a mistake. I said to him in the parking lot, I said, uncle, could you tell me something about the, the Ilocano uh, epic poems? The guy didn't stop talking for the next four hours. He was repeating all these poems to us. And Fred was going crazy because he was supposed to be silent and he was supposed to be quiet. And miss we had to make sure that Trinidad didn't sit in the same place on the plane with us because he didn't stop talking until we reached Texas. And the, the thing is, but the reason he had to come was he was the older, only, only one of the older generation who was able to give a presentation to that conference. The significance of Louisiana was, it was at that time the site of the first villages, uh, Filipino American villages, and we wanted to highlight that. Um, one of the trips that Marina set up was a trip to Barataria Bay to see the, the remnants of uh, the Manila village that was there. And um, she called me up and said, we can only put 35 people on the boat. And I said, well, 50 people have signed up. And I said, well, tell her that, tell them this. Filipinos are little people. And we, <laughs> each one of us is one and a half the size. I mean, it'd be one and a half of us would equal the size of one white man. <laughs> that. And so we were able to cram into the boat, 50 people. Everybody was jabbering. We went from uh, Louisiana, from New Orleans, to the bayous, we had a police expo, uh, uh, escort, and uh, at luncheon, um, one of the guys uh, who was with us, um, 
Reverend Solis said to the, the, the white historian who was with us, can you tell us what could be a remnant of the presence of Filipinos? And as we were going by there, we saw houses built out over the water. And the man said, well, I don't rightly recall. And he said, well, these homes that are built over the water are, are typical of what's in the Philippines, especially the southern part of the Philippines. And the guy never understood that. So we get to Barataria Bay. Everybody was jabbering. And over there, and all of a sudden, we see the pilings in this faraway place. Barataria Bay is huge. It leads out into the Gulf of Mexico. And the guy, the white scholar says to us, over yonder are the remnants of Manila Village. Everybody stopped talking. The people on the boat included first-time people, the people from Chicago, St. Louis, and immediately was one of the reasons why they became part of our strongest members of Juan's later on. So in the evening, the last evening, Marina had uh, the descendants of... Okay, Auntie, uh, you're breaking up, but I just got to thumb through the program real quick. So we kind of see how that program looked like. Uh, see, we even had our our meeting. Look, look how long our first annual meeting was. One hour. Okay. The first one, yeah. <laughs> and then we had a, a, a author's reception. Yeah, and, and we on, did. And on Saturday, we had uh, the workshops here. And look at, you had Helen Brown as it was the moderator for this uh, session. Uh, and then here's a list of, whoops, here's the list yeah. of, uh, of, of the people that were, were there. Uh, look at the, uh, look at the bios. And if you see my bio, dentist. <laughs> now, that's, that's cool. That's cool. But I just wanted, to, I wanted people to, to see how we described ourselves and, and throughout uh, these programs, you'll see how these uh, definitions how you, has, has, has how you progress, right? And now uh, here's, you know, here's here's Trinidad Rojo right here, scholar, you, Seattle. Didn't even put Washington, just Seattle. <laughs> but everybody, yeah. Trinidad everybody. Rojo it was a brilliant scholar. I mean, he in his sixties, it was Mr. Uh, Doctor uh, Trinidad and uh, 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 Bacho, Vic Bacho. Two of them, they were in their 60s and they um, did some activism and all of a sudden you had Jose Rizal Bridge and Jose Rizal Park. So you're never too young to be an activist. These guys did that in their 60s. Uh, this is some of the, uh, uh, Uncle Fred was the president, Uncle Pete was vice president, Karen Johnstone, you guys could see the officers there. Um, let me go to the next one. Is there a next one? No, there isn't. Exactly. It's just one page. It's a, <laughs> okay. Okay, go ahead, Auntie. I'm sorry. I just wanted to show the, the people real quick. Yeah. Program. Well, the, well, the significant thing of it is when the lady, the young lady who was the MC, who didn't look Filipino at all, she had light brown hair and hazel eyes. She's uh, very proud to say that I'm a sixth generation Filipino American. And everybody started figuring out how many generations that was and how many generations who went back into the United States of America. Uh, the New Orleans conference was very significant. It showed us, it, also at that thing I'm, I'm, is in the side, there was a person who was brought there by um, Helen Brown, and she was on my panel called New Research. And in that research, uh, Eloisa Bora then uh, gave us her, her Bill on the research he was doing, she showed that in the early uh, village, I mean, boats coming over from the Philippines on the galleons, at, at first, Filipino women were brought to serve as you know what for the men on the ship. By the time they reached the New World, they were pregnant and wow. set aside. Yeah, set aside. And their children and the women were there in um, Mexico. Hmm. And uh, it it didn't last for, I don't know how long, but the, the Catholic Church threatened the captains to, if they continued, they'd all be excommunicated. And so they stopped doing it. But the whole fact is this happened. And so we do know for a fact that there were Filipino children being born in Mexico 
who were conceived on the trip across uh, the galleons in the very beginning. It's another bit of research we should do. Okay. So Sac Sacramento was Joni's. Yeah, Joni. And yeah, and, and it was interesting because um, with this, she brought in a whole new crew, especially her cohorts, her classmates, her colleagues, her friends from uh, Santa Cruz. And um, it was also significant in this. Um, by this time, we were bringing in college students. And uh, there were several firsts on this. Um, it was the first um, book um, Let's see, the, the author's reception, this was the first time, because we had authors there. Um, and uh, the tour, like Joni said earlier, was uh, called out because of the weather. And the weather caused, uh, made us all stay indoors, so it was too hot to go outside. But what the significance, though, is that it, it made a man write an article in the paper afterwards, Frank um, Perez. And in the article, he he praised Fonz. He said it's the first Filipino organization he's ever seen, and he's an old timer, and he's been covering Filipino news for 50, 60 years, where there were all kinds of Filipino Americans of all ages, um, Philippine born, American born, young and old, all mingling together for one purpose to do Filipino American history. And for him, it was very significant because that wasn't done in any other organization in the United States. So uh, Joni put on for the first time um, audiovisual presentations, a stage presentation. And um, we older people couldn't have done it. This was part of new old younger people at that time, well, 1990, 30 years ago. And they were all in their early 20s at that time. So are you going to read who um, the um, they paid? I forget what the I think the theme was um, the legacy lives and all of the all the young people who are working on it, all their dads and maybe some of their mothers came early on. So it was a case of um, honoring their their parents. Okay. And we had skull. Yeah. OK, Chicago. Chicago wasn't, okay, going back. Oh, yeah, and then we had, by that time, we did have a chap, some chapters. All right, Chicago was actually put in cooperation. We did it together with the Filipino American Historical Society of Chicago. It was not a chapter. Australia Alomar was a president, and, but she was a member of FONS. She was a trustee of FONS. And so together we did it, and we underwrote it. And um, it was... Um, it was interesting. It was we had a lot of um, a lot of peers who were similar to in because we were second generation West Coast and they were second generation Midwest, but they had a different orientation from us. They were like um, somebody said we were Filipinos on weekends. The rest of the week they probably weren't, and so that was an interesting. I couldn't put my head around that. I guess I didn't know if they never suffered discrimination or whether they just, whatever, just became fully American during the rest of the time, not like with some of us. During this time uh, in Chicago, one of the things I remember is there was no committee really to help Australia to do a lot of things. So all the people from the then existing chapters uh, we all pitched in to man the tables and to do the things, give out information well, actually, to help her out. Actually, Dorothy, I, if I remember when, when we first got there, she broke yeah. down and cried. Yeah, I'm she like, did. what's wrong, Estrella? And then she said that she had nobody to help her. No one to help her. So we all pitched in. Yes. And, um, and it was good because it was, we're fat. Emily, I think by that time it's the fourth one. And it was a case that it's not going that way because there was no chapter there. And she had a few friends, but it was, it was an interesting time. It was, um, we had the election. I, I remember during the elections, um, people, oh, I remember they were charging us for everything. <laughs> I heard, 
it was at the Hilton. So I'm always watching the budget. And then somebody said, they're charging you for the pencils on the table. I said, what? They said, all the candy on the table. So I start making announcements. Take all the pencils. Take everything on the tables. We're getting charged for them. So you might as well bring it on. Don't leave it there. I mean, you know, what the heck? Yeah. It was, there was... There was a tornado or her tornado. Do you remember yeah, that yes, was there? Yes. It, the, the lights blew out. It was absolutely dark. It was so exciting. We'd never been in a blackout in another city. Yeah, but we but were in the, it was we were, great. We were on the, like the 20th floor or something like that. So we weren't on ground level. We were way up in the, in the <laughs> yeah, sky. But then you could see all the garbage, you know, getting blown up to the sky. I was like, "Look at this!" So yeah, I know it was it was also, amazing. And also, uh, that was the first time that our chapter we brought ten ODU students for the first time, and and like <laughs> these guys here, they like I don't know this is like East Coast college Filipino American <laughs> students. They're totally different than on the West Coast. So what they did is they wore oh, every each and everyone wore the same thing like a football team. They had ODU, you know, <laughs> across the chest. So they came up there and, and then here was funny is that there were about 10 of them and they said, we're going to save money. We're all going to stay in one room. <laughs> and I said, one room. And then one of them brought a rice cooker. Like, you know, they wanted to save money. Well, <laughs> after one night, <laughs> they, they said, no, this is not going to work. But that was my that was my memory for that that conference uh, uh, of these students. And it's, it was just uh, uh, a remarkable type of uh, venue. And you, like you said, uh, and then Elena Palapio, that's Dr. Uh, Gil Palapio's uh, uh, wife, started to bring in, you know, food <laughs> for, for us. And that's uh, kindly um, put down there. So from Chicago, we moved on to the Bay. And that was a very good one. It was The, the difference with this is um, we already had a consortium of different chapters. It was San Francisco, East Bay, uh, Vallejo, um, uh, Santa Clara County. And they worked together uh, to put this on. And uh, they were honoring the British generation of which Terry and Pete, who were the chair, are members of. We were the sons and the daughters of the pioneers, you know, Filipino pioneers. Uh, it was well attended, uh, especially at the dinner. Not everybody who came to the, the banquet attended the conference. It was mostly young people, the chapter members. But what I remember was uh, Pete really worked hard on getting information on all. The, he, they honored specific uh, bridge generation um, Filipino Americans who accomplished something, you know, later on in life. And almost all of us had come out of poverty or very low income. We were pretty much probably fulfilling the dreams maybe our parents had. Um, but uh, I remember it was, what was interesting about this is 500 people came, attended the dinner, so much so that we had to set up another room um, to carry the, the, the slop over. And the younger people all entered to sit in the other room because they wanted to socialize because the older ones who were coming in to be honored uh, needed room. And that's uh, and the, the place wasn't very large. But uh, that was, it was a, that to me was a tribute to Terry's um, know how. She, at that time, she was president of FONS and um, she was a very great organizer. I I don't know what else I could say about it. I mean, since I kept all my notes. Oh, 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 the, uh, oh no. One the, thing the I comedians, remember. The comedians. The comedians. I never forgot it. One night after the session, these young people came and they told us to go into this big, the big room. And they were on stage. They started telling these stories that were hilarious. They're really, they're doing it in an accent, talking about their parents and everything. And we were on the floor pounding the ground because it was so yeah. funny. There were Filipinos who were there and they're looking at us like, what? Why are you laughing? It's not so funny. But to us, it really hit our soul. And it was it? I mean, they were just beginning yeah. in their career. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could have been one of their biggest audiences. And they probably hit these little clubs before, but we had something like two or 300 people there watching them. Right. So the San... Okay. I'm trying... Then we went all the way across the country for the first time. Oh, yeah. New York. That was New York. Ray Alejandro and I worked on New York. 
And I thought, okay, by this time, I'm going to be really smart to put our down payment on the hotel right away. Well, what happened was after we did all, all the planning and everything, and everything was going to go hunky dory, Ray calls me up and he says, um, the hotel's not ready. And I said, what do you mean it's not ready? They were, because when we signed for it, uh, they were going, they were remodeling the hotel. And it was a Roosevelt Hotel. And we said, he said, they're not going to be finished until two or three months after it. I called them up and I said, hey, wait a minute. We have a conference coming up. I mean, we signed a contract with you. And so what they had to do, they had to find us another place. It was across the street from Central Park, which was more expensive. It's so the we negotiated. They had the to pay. Yeah, they had to pay. Park Central, that's what it was. And it was, um, so Ray and I then had to really adjust this budget uh, to make it happen because the budget that we'd been working on was at the less expensive hotel, Roosevelt. And we had to pay $16,000 more than what we were paying at the other place. Uh, the whole, so what we decided was we wouldn't eat at that okay. hotel at all. <laughs> <We couldn't. laughs> no, except for coffee in the morning. That was about it. No, no pastry, no nothing. I mean, but as it turned out, a lot of people went to New York. They were tourists. Every morning I'd see people saying to me goodbye. And I'd say, where are you going? They said, we're going to go to visit and i said you gotta say you're supposed to be here for the conference and they said well they'll, they'll be back but anyway we had some heavy hitters there uh, who attended the conference there was lloyd lewis and um uh the the dress designer um i forget her name now Josie Notori. And, uh, yeah that's Josie right Notori. yeah josie notori and uh one who became uh one of our um our trustee later, she was uh, Lilia Clemente. And uh, anyway, it was an interesting, so Ray was very, very, what he did. So after we talked about it, we said, you know, we got to keep, I, I can't be owing $16,000 after this thing. So what he did is the author reception, he talked the consulate, the Philippine consulate into having it there. So he did all the cooking. He was a chef, so he did all the cooking ahead of time, and it was grand because we were there hobnobbing with all the you know who's who among the Filipinos in New York City, and and then he said, now the the dinner is going to be at a Chinatown, and we all have to take the subways. Well, that was quite an excursion. Everybody said, wow, we've never taken the subway before. So you had all these people going by subway to the thing in the big restaurant, and and Ray. Uh, God bless him, uh, because I was counting up what we had. He paid for the for the restaurant bill with his credit card, and I just paid him afterwards. We went didn't go in the hole, but actually, because of us possibly going in the hole, that was the first time we ever had an auction. I was going around to the vendors and begging them, "Do you have anything you'd like to lend us or give us, donate to us? Because we're going to have a small auction at the." at the membership meeting to see if we can raise a little bit of money to pay off some of our bills. And so we had a, the first auction. So there is always the first something going on at one of the things, sometimes out of desperation. But people remember the trip on the subways. They remember the tours. And for some people, I remember it was the first time I went to a Starbucks, which happened to have been in New York City. And it showed that there was a connection between the East Coast and the West Coast because of that coffee thing. Um, by this time, it was interesting because that was one conference where the speakers who Ray had invited to give presentations all refused to pay. <laughs> and I was standing at the... So in addition to me having that additional thing, I had to work. I don't know how it happened. I as they would come up to me and say, I'm not paying because I'm speaking, I had to tell <laughs> okay, I don't want to cause any people already had too many problems. Let them go. They just, it's just the fun people will just cover it. And we did go in the hole. Yeah. We paid all the bills. It was, yeah. Now, see, that, 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 in that conference too, uh, Rhea Bispo, he brings uh, 12 high school students out of Virginia Beach 
And here uh -huh. we are, the first time in New York City, and, and the kids just said, okay, our first meal, we'll just eat at McDonald's. Can you believe that? But anyway, at the gala, like <laughs> Dorothy was talking about, was held at a Chinese restaurant, and everybody, we all took the subway. But then one of Ray's kids got sick from an allergic response to the food, but then uh, Dr. Gail Palapio <laughs> attended to her health. And so, you know, she survived that evening. But the next day, Ray's flight got canceled. And so all, all these parents were calling Ray up saying, hey, where's my kid? Where's my kid? And then, <laughs> and then and Ray had to figure out, well, how are we gonna, what's he going to do? Because we already checked out from the hotel. And, and, then, and then we and I, we were already gone. But then see, B.J. Manuel, in, he lived in uh -huh. New York City. Who B.J. Manuel is like one of the the the, the founders of this organization called FIND, F-I-N-D, oh, which, yeah. which is a college network, uh, 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 a huge college network uh, uh, of, of, of colleges and universities on, on the East Coast. He founded that and uh, uh, BJ volunteered his house and said, okay, you students, you can stay right here. So that was so cool. And uh, Ray turned into a man that day. <laughs> Uh, the New York conference, that was my first conference because I was a chapter president of the San Diego Fonz chapter oh, yeah, in 96. Yeah, yeah. So I flew there with Joel San Juan and we stayed at his brother's house in New Jersey. So every day we took a train from New Jersey <laughs> to Penn Station and we walked 15 blocks because we were afraid to take the subway. We had never <laughs> been to New York before to the East Coast. And every day I was so hot and sweaty. Oh my God, I don't even have a room. We're going to take a shower. I can't. got to go back to New Jersey. You know? So that was my first conference, just learning everything. And yeah, meeting, and, and that's how I met everybody. Ron. We, we, uh, we were having to take a share the urinal together. We took a piss <laughs> after we met, you know, in the bathroom. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say something about the restaurant. Everyone was waiting for the rice. Like, when is the rice coming? But the rice. That's the rice. That's the banquet, banquet style. Yeah, try, and, I didn't know. And as soon as the group left, then they rolled up the carpet, put away the dishes. We we're the only one there. It was quite an experience. And that hotel, my sisters would call it the hotel from hell. It was so interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was a great location because it was right across the street from Carnegie Hall, and it was uh -huh. like one block away from Central Park. And then, so that's the first time I ever had. I, I don't know if you guys ever had a Carnegie Carnegie. Uh, was it pastrami sandwich? I mean, those suckers are huge. But uh, that was that was a very very memorable that's conference. I, I really yeah. enjoyed that, and that's when you you had like Mark Polito was there. They started to bond with a, a lot of West Coast uh, youngsters like Mark Polito. To start to bond Joe with Montana. like Joe Montana on the East Coast. A lot of these college students started to network that way. So that's where you know it was a great bonding experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then so from there we went to Portland, right, Auntie Dorothy? Yeah, and that was going to be the. Um, um, anniversary of the Spanish-American War, whereby after the war, uh, Filipinos became Filipino-American, I mean, Filipino national, American national, the Philippines became um, a colony. Mm -hmm. And it was the beginning of us coming here, you know, well, there were already Filipinos here, different ones uh, who were coming before that. But so uh, the chair people were, um, um, Concordia um, uh, and um, Mamarel and um, Lourdes Markley. And we were uh, in the Double Tree Inn right by the Columbia River. Yeah. And um, a lot of people came because it was pretty central. Uh, it was between Seattle, the Northwest, and California. And uh, we, um, it was very well attended. It was uh, it was the first time that people like Bob Santos came. They were talking by that time that we were talking about civil rights and uh, people who actually before a lot of times we were talking about things that had happened, people who were dead. But now we're talking about things where people, our generation was doing things. And um, what impressed me is how hard, even though. We found out then that at the hotels, because by this time people were getting more techie, people wanted to show, they didn't just want to talk, they wanted to show pictures. And uh, 
the hotels would charge us for the use of the things. So one of the, the members of the, um, of, uh, the uh, Oregon Fawns, he and his son, spent that whole time lugging equipment from one place to another. I'll never forget. I don't think he saw anything. All I could, Every time I could see him, he and his son were just lugging all the equipment from one place to another. Wow. It made me realize that uh, if we do budgets, we have to really consider the cost of um, audiovisual equipment uh, yeah. within the hotels. So one of the things that, that caught me, it was the, the one time when we had after hours uh, events and um, people wanted, what we planned for the program was one thing, but people wanted to continue on after the sessions. So we were having evening sessions uh, to a certain extent. We were also, 50 of us were also planning to go on to another event in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was set up by Gil Palapil and who was then the, still the president of uh, FONS, the national president of FON. And um, so we, after that conference, we just left right away and I didn't settle any of the accounts and uh, with uh, Portland, but I'll tell you that's, well, I'll tell you now. What happened was when people were registering for the Portland conference, they were told to go the Double Tree Inn there were three double tree inns within miles of each other, one on the <laughs> other side of the Columbia River, Washington State, <laughs> and two in Wash in Oregon. And people were going there. So by the time I returned from the Philippines, I got a big bill because we didn't fulfill the number of of rooms in the main double tree inn. And they were charging me, yeah. I was getting now charged big time for the use of the rooms that we use for the conference. Mm. And, but we paid it off. Well, it okay, was, that's, that's true. And so what we did was, uh, I remember we left on Sunday, we had to go back to Seattle because we had to catch that flight to go to the Philippines. That and, night. Uh, yeah, yeah, that night. And yeah. so, um, uh, out of the out of out of out of, out of um, a majority of us, that was the first time we ever been to the Philippines, mm -hmm. and like for months, I mean, we did not hear anything, you know, on 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 the people that was hosting us. Like we wanted to get an idea as far as how many people are going to show up, what should we wear, nothing, no communication whatsoever. And so I remember we were on the airplane. Everybody was talking, well, you know, if nobody shows up, we're just going to party for three days. And so we looked at each other and the running joke was, is this the Philippines? You know, so that was the running joke. But uh, here is the, uh, our, the program that they put on. And this program is a very, very nice material because it, 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 it preserved really well. Uh, let me thumb, thumb through this real quick uh, so that you can get an idea. Well, you guys have a copy of this. So I just wanted to just... Uh, give Auntie Dorothy time to drink her coffee and use the bathroom. So this is my little commercial break. Thank Auntie you. Dorothy. So, um, we had these big wigs, you know, they were there. There's Dr. Palapio. Um, let's see if I can focus in a little bit more. Well, you guys can see this anyway. Um, this was the uh, day one type of thing. Um, day two. Uh, okay, there's Look at look at my presentation, Auntie Dorothy. From the Ilocos to immortality. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there's Emily. She did it on Pensanados. Uh, that was I, I had to look at that one. I said, wow, did I do that one? <laughs> Pull that out. Anyway, uh, let's go on. And uh, they had uh, all these wonderful uh, uh, things here. But... Uh, uh, here's the bios that uh, uh, that's in there. There's Uncle Fred's, uh, Gills. Uh, look at Emily's. Emily's like almost half a book there. <laughs> and then <laughs> then uh, there's James. Uh, there's mine. Mine's real short, you know, simple. Anyway, coming through. There's Edwina's bio. Uh, there's your bio, Auntie Dorothy. You know, just a little paragraph there. And, <laughs> Uh, look at Joan Mace. She started to, you know, bust up and start to write these essays. 
And look at that. That was the first one. Here's your second one. She had two bottles <laughs> in there. Dang, Joni. Then here's Those Emily again. Oh, I, oh, these are actually just descriptions of the workshops. I'm sorry. Um. Those are bios. <laughs> but you guys have that, so you guys could, could, could look at it. There's the bios right there. Uh, it, was a, it, was, it was just a tremendous experience. So we didn't know what to expect. So well, when we I, get off the plane, we were greeted by these guys. They're over here, you know, <laughs> playing, you know, Rondalia band, you know, welcome home. And we're saying, welcome home. This is the first time we were here. So I said, Edwina, get up there and just stand by them. I got to take a picture of this. So, you know, these are musicians <laughs> that greeted us off the plane. Right. And then I remember further on down the gangplank, they had this sign that says, Filipinos here, all others here. And I just looked at myself and said, damn, what line are we supposed to stay in? <laughs> Right, Angie Dorothy? But uh, that right then realized that, you know, I wasn't Filipino no more. You know, I'm an American. So uh, this is, they have some real nice buses. That's, I mean, that's James Sobredo right there behind us. Um, I think they had like two or two buses, about 20 people in each bus. Yeah. Real nice buses. They hauled us around. Uh, we stayed at the Manila Hotel. Uh, so we're going, okay, is this thing for real? So the next day, I, you know, I used to get up early. I used to be a, a runner. I used to, like, run. So I, I remember running down Rojas Boulevard, which was right outside of the Manila Hotel. And, but it was so smoggy and smoky, and my lungs were just, you know, I was coughing the whole time on the way back. And then um, I started to notice all these people were starting to come into the hotel. You know, they were all dressed up. And, and I said, oh, my God. These guys are coming in in hordes of people and they're all dressed up. And like, that's the choir. Okay. And for the first time, when they sang the Philippine national anthem, I freaking cried. I said, Oh my God, I'm in, I'm at home, my ancestral land, the Philippines. <laughs> I mean, to hear the Philippine anthem sung by real Filipinos, oh my God. <laughs> They were amazing, amazing. <laughs> and then, look at there's a packed house. That's my mom in front, and my uncle Pepe. I've never saw before, so I had a whole, I had a whole tribe of people come say, "Oh, you got to hear my son. He's going to speak." And so they're <laughs> all up there. But they remember Auntie Dorothy? They had, they had all of us sitting up front. Yeah. And all the other people were kind of sitting towards the back. That's Val. Uh, and okay, this is lunch. This is lunch. This is like, look, look how formal it was. And <laughs> we were well, well fed. Like every yeah. two hours, we had real Filipino food. <laughs> I mean, it was real. I mean, it's just no comparison. And then at yeah. midnight, remember the hollow, hollow bar? Oh, my God. You know, they had a hollow, hollow bar. You had all the pixies. And it was all you could eat. That's when I yeah. fell in love with mangoes. <laughs> but here's, uh, here's Edwina. She's up there. And then there's Uncle Fred and the guy that's holding that book there. When he saw um, me do my presentation on, on the Elecanos to Immortality, he was so impressed. He wrote his book. He gave me a copy of his book. And it's called La Union, <laughs> which is a province in the Philippines of Elecanos. But it's just me and him. Uh, this is uh, Manila Hotel. Look how nice it was. Everything was just so, so formal, so authentic. And... <laughs> Again, I wasn't too experienced, you know, talking. You'll notice I have a freaking coat on, you know, a blazer. I'm sweating like crazy. I said, man, this is the Philippines. You're supposed to be wearing, you know, something light. But then I, I told people, I said, well, at least I could tell, I, I could prove to people I'm from America. <laughs> anyway, that's inside joke. Anyway, and there's art. Hey, oh, look at Joni, me. look at Emily. Oi, oi, my goodness. And then so like, uh, there's uh, Joni and Emily. <laughs> but the highlight, the highlight of my trip, we had a, a trip to uh, Emilio Aguinaldo's house in Kawit. And so like everybody was in the house, they were doing, you know, magnificent house, but I, I was, I wanted to get some air. So I went outside the, to the garden and I saw this other house that was in the back. So I went there and I started to peek my head in and this lady, she was all well-dressed, you know, she came out, she was like doing the, the garden and we started to talk and they found out that she was the granddaughter of Emilio Aguinaldo. 
Mm. And so I, and that little house that was in the back was where he hung out. That was like his study. And that's just, that's a picture of him. So this is my memorable moment in Manila is to take a picture in Emilio Aguinaldo's house with her granddaughter. Okay. Uh, we have other, you guys want to chime in, Joni? I mean, Emily, you know. Emily. Well, I, you know. I want to say something about, um, one of my presentations was on the oral history project, project from Stockton Voices. And we brought a tape from that of Ray students performing and we couldn't really see the little screen, but I remember hearing the voices of Ray students and these were Manung and Manung's voices from, from our interviews in Stockton and their voices were now filling the room in this grand ballroom and we're having like this international discussion. So all the generations and all the voices were present. I, I, I will remember that. Right. And we told Gil Palapa's wife, Gil, um, no, Art Villarreal was inducted as president. Yeah, I'm glad you conference. said that. So Emily and I told his wife that she's going to be first lady and she'll be installed. <laughs> so she went out and bought this beautiful terno. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you guys could read all the stuff here. We're just giving you guys like a cliff, cliff note version as we move on from Portland. Uh, we went to Manila. That was the first conference we did back to back, back to back countries. So I don't know if we're ever going to do that again, Auntie Dorothy. You no, think so? I don't think. Huh? Uh, actually, actually, you know, it was really interesting because we were working on the um, how do we fly the people at the cheapest rate. So I had a really good friend, my compadre, um, Lucho Singh, yeah. and he played he played golf with this person who was. Uh, uh, the uh, executive with uh, the Korean Airlines, and he got us the cheapest rates that they could. That's why we, we were able to afford going there. It yeah. was, yeah. Uh, but one of the things that I think the aftermath, after the conference is over, all of us took side trips. Yes. And, and we each went to the um, where our parents came from. Correct. And then, we, and then we agreed that we would meet right before we returned back to right. the United States. Yeah, because I, I travel with uh, with my mom and two aunts, and we went to Bacnot and La Union for the first time, and that was like a four hour drive from Manila to uh, to La Union, and I remember um, going into the house, and it's like very 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 humble, uh, you know, surroundings, mm -hmm. and like uh, that evening they gave us the mosquito net, me and Edwina, and then my aunts. Um, all decided to sleep in one bed all together like they were little kids, you know, four of them. So in the morning, you know, we woke up and uh, my aunts, they had all these mosquito bites and then and we, um, we, we just didn't have anything. But what we did have, though, every meal we were there, we had goat. All things. <laughs> Which is a delicacy for, you know, you Elecanos out there. You know what I'm talking about. But Edwina got sick. She goes, I can't be eating this goat, 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 goat. Bah. Anyway, uh, so that was another another memorable moment. So uh, great times. So we go all the way back to the East Coast. And guess where we lined up? Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, so let me see. Let me... Uh, can, can I just say, can I just say something here? You can say anything, uh, Auntie. No, no, because Fred used to set up the conferences after, after uh, the one in um, starting with the Sacramento one. He said we should do ten years of planning. So when you saw that the year two thousand, you told Fred you wanted the year two thousand. <laughs> yeah, <You> would, <laughs> that's right. And, and so the, you, prob the problem was is that. We didn't have anybody in our chapter. Yeah. And then it's like, but then I had to I had to say that because they would force me to go out and start recruiting, you know, people. And so uh you'll yeah. see I got pictures as far as the kind of people we had at our conference were really, really young. I mean, can we're I, talking about I say high something, school. Alan? Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, this is the first conference that was coordinated by mostly college and high school students. That was our crew. So while they were doing registration, they had to take a break because they had to get ready for the performance that night. But the <laughs> reason why it was 
um, at Virginia Wesleyan is because it came to the point where these conferences were getting expensive. So we explored the idea of having uh, conferences at a college and for $25 a night um, and maybe a small cost for food. It was a very interesting experience, although everyone can't just get up at a certain time and go to the uh, the cafeteria because you can only eat like within two hours and it was quite an experience especially when we had to coordinate and i know darva's there she coordinated the housing oh darva. yeah we had dorm rooms and, and we forgot to tell people to you know bring pillows and blankets yeah, and sheets and so, <laughs> ben Manor was stealing the linen out of, out of you know the, the the kitchen for people to use for for uh, it was quite uh, an experience. uh but uh, this is the, you, you guys have a copy of this, of the program here. Let me just thumb through this real quick. Uh, I just wanted to say too, it was the first time that we started having tours in the local area. And we even had our own uh, club, you know, for partying yeah. <laughs> right up the street because one of our members had a restaurant and people just loved it. They just loved going there just, just for the fun people. It was quite memorable. Uncle Peter, his hand up. <laughs> Well, I, I remember when I went into the dorms. Well, there were two things I remember. First, Alan told me that it's going to be really hot. <laughs> so a lot of us, a lot of us only brought clothes for hot weather and no coats. I mean, no jackets, hardly any sweaters, nothing like that. And a storm came up right the day, the night before the conference. So much so that a lot of people who were coming by plane, their planes were all delayed. And um, But there were two things. When I went into the dorms, I noticed, well, mine was decent. I had a bed. But one of the older women came to me and they said, when they went into their dorm room, their their bed was way, way up high. It was too high. <laughs> 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 To climb up the ladder. And these are, I'm talking about 65-year-old ladies, okay. And I said, well, what was under there? They said, nothing. And I said, nothing. I went in the room and I thought, how come the bed so high? <laughs> Why did they have that? And they told me that that's where the students put their tables to study. And the, they were good sports. <laughs> Every night they would climb up great big things. And oh, yeah. I just was hoping to God that they didn't fall out of bed every night. <laughs> And also, uh, in other... our program, if you if you notice, I think this is the first time uh, Jody kept on saying we need to have a, a PNI Power workshop, and so we decided, okay, we'll go ahead and do it. So that uh, closing plenary on uh, that first night there, uh, you had the uh, what are we doing? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, look at our panelists. You had Dorothy, Auntie Dorothy, Joan May. I can't Don read this. Don, uh, Don, Allison. Allison, and Emily. Now, what a lineup. <laughs> I also wanted to mention that dining hall dinner is supposed to be um, reception. Um, the, the pig was late because of the rain. Oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got a slide on that. So okay. hold on, hold on. Whoops. <laughs> So everyone oh. ate, and but the pig arrived late. But for some reason, they had the energy to get up and eat again. It was quite interesting. <laughs> Before we move forward, uh, Uncle Peter has a question about the bridge generation. Uh, OK, oh, we'll do that later, Uncle Pete, because uh, we still have other information to go through, OK? Uh, I will definitely get back to you after we go through this, uh, uh, the rest of this presentation, OK? You will. I will, I will not forget. Everybody will stay in tune, too, OK? But anyway, this is the this is the uh, the slide that uh, of depicting um, our we decided to do a community dinner, dinner. you know, as as uh, for the first time. So uh, this is the line. So we had all our ex Navy chefs. Mm -hmm. You know, they came out. They cooked their you know a na not Navy food but American food. So you had roast beef, fried chicken, vegetables, and it was just a tremendous spread. And you know, like you know, we got everybody was full. You go through the picture gallery. Oh, I don't know what happened to my thing here. Okay, now here's 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 the line. Now look at my crew. That's my that's my crew that I had to work with. You know, yeah, and that's the crew on the left. The people on the right are the guests. Okay, <laughs> now look at this young blood. He had to stand on a chair. 
And I, I, I said, now you could count to two, right? Everybody only gets two, two lumpia, that's it. So that's how young my, our people were. We were getting kids up there. And then the lechon came. And the reason why it came late was because it was raining so hard, it couldn't cook in time. But then, like everybody, like I said, everybody was lounging around. But when they saw the pig, that thing was gone. Look at everybody just surrounding that thing. <laughs> and and <laughs> there's Uncle Fred. He had to get a piece of that skin. So, you know, of course, you know, he got that. Uh, that evening, uh, Ray Obispo's crew, you know, we put together those, those uh, dramatizations. They performed voices. Um, tremendous, <laughs> tremendous performance. Because that evening, we, we advertised it as National Spoken Night, no, the National Spoken Word Night. So you had other artists that from across the country, they performed also. There's Uncle Roy Morales. He was at our, he was at our conference. Uh, the debut, remember that movie, The Debut? Where they made the debut there at Fonz. Now look at this picture here. You got Alex. Oh, I mean, there's John Elisario, there's Rex, then Allison Dela Cruz. I don't know if you guys remember her. Then you got Don. She, they were on the panel. And there's your P9 Power panel right there. Of course, that's that's Emily. She still looks the same, huh? With that mic in hand. <laughs> and then the next night we had our Pinoy Power thing. But... Uh, this is our guest speaker there was on the left. That's uh, Bobby Scott. Oh, Scott. Then Edwin was the vice president at the time. Then Art Villaruz was the president. Yeah. Now look at the young guy on the right. That's, That's Diego Guillermo. Guillermo. Oh, oh, oh. That's his first time. Yeah. Who's running the, uh, who's in charge of the Fonz National Museum in Stockton. So that's Emil. He was our other guest speaker. There's uh, Bobby Scott. Then, uh, Joni, you can say a few words about this young lady that we gave a, uh, okay. an award to. This is Angel Bantillo Magdael from Stockton of the sixth generation Bantillo clan that includes Ray Townsend and all the, and so she was getting the Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, it was a clock for timeless compassion. And while she was in her wheelchair, it was a total surprise and Ray's students were performing her oral history. Oh, wow. And the whole banquet room cried. It was so moving. It was really, really moving. Mm -hmm. Then we had some really nice, there, there's Titiana Buckholt. Then we had the group from Boston. They had a, they, uh, Joni's uh, chapter. That's uh, Escuela Hung Filipino. They were trained by Michael Dada. Okay, so, they were outstanding. Yeah. They're life members of Fonz, the the group from Boston. Yeah. And you had this group from uh, um, the Bay Area. They're called Drop in Harmony. They performed. And then, of course, you had the famous sexy Rex Navarrete <laughs> close the show. So uh, let me see here. Then you guys have um, these notes that you guys could see and read as we move um, to our next conference, which is in LA. Go ahead, Auntie Dorothy. Uh, the LA chapter pretty much took care of their own. Uh, they, Emily's there, she was part of the committee. Uh, what was interesting to me, it was, uh, part of it was uh, on the, uh, the Loyola um, Paramount. Uh, campus, yeah. And uh, also, uh, part of it was on the old Howard Hughes headquarters, uh, which was turned over to the university several years earlier. So one of the things that people remembered is the distances they had to walk from one place to another, which was okay. They had to walk up this hill and then on the campus, go to the auditorium and then back down again into where all the workshops was. It was, uh, it was an interesting conference because uh, we, we had just come out of St. Louis. I mean, from it, things were changing, I would say, for funds. We were having different things. What was interesting to me is um, the, the daughters of the man who had lent me some photographs, gave me photographs that, were, that have been used time and time again, Mr. Mankow. They came for the first time to a conference, 
And during that time, what they did is they were so touched by people buying the book with their dad's picture on the cover and into the book that they came and they handed me a slip of paper that turned over all their all Fred Man, I mean Frank Mankow's photographs to my son, the two daughters, and um, it was. I'm not sure. I mean, how many hundreds of people? It must have been close to four, five hundred people who came off and on uh, to the thing. I think it was the last one of the last times we had a lot of the bridge generation there. They, they by this time, many of us were kind of getting old. Okay. And you guys have this. Uh, Emily kindly put down the, the program there and shared. Emily something. worked on that program. Yeah. She could say something. Is she here? Yeah. I'm here. Oh, go ahead, Emily. I, I, I don't know how to work Zooms. So I don't even know who's here. I'm just over here just scrolling. No, so enjoying, go ahead. I'm enjoying listening to Auntie Dorothy and everybody's uh, memories. This, this conference, I was. Uh, program co-chair in Los Angeles with Gerald Gubaton. Ed Ramaletti was the overall chair. We had a committee of about 40 people. <laughs> and it was the first time we had co-sponsored a, a, or co-hosted a conference with three different chapters, Los Angeles, uh, San Diego, and Central Coast chapter. Um, and so I uh, found the press release that Ed Ramaletti sent out in 2002, uh, and uh, it's, it's on that document with some memories. The, the greatest thing I think that happened for me was I got to meet Vicki Manalo Draves. Yeah, uh, that was right. one of my um, one of my goals for that conference because uh, she, you know she was a, a, a two-time Olympic gold medalist and and some of our members had connections with her in California and so uh, just shout out to our our team who made that happen. We also uh, had uh, the Aleto family speak on a plenary about the hate crime that happened to Joseph Aleto. That was also one of our goals. We wanted to make sure to highlight the history of that and connect it to earlier histories of violence against Filipinos. And I think um, it was really uh, well done. Um, we also debuted, I didn't put this on the, <laughs> I didn't put this on that document, but we also debuted uh, our book, Filipino Women in Detroit. Uh, and we brought three elders, uh, the, the main narratives from the book and launched it there in Los Angeles at the book signing reception and their families came and we sold out of the book. <laughs> because so, so, so many of their families uh, 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 bought them. And then Linda Nietes, who was our longtime book uh, seller, she bought the rest that we had brought. Um, and I just want to give a shout out too to Kenyon Chan because of his love for Auntie Dorothy, they had served on a uh, on the Association for Asian American Studies board together. He w became the new dean of LMU at that time, and he mm. was my oh yeah he was my boss when I taught at Cal State University Northridge. So Uncle Sam and I went to meet with him one day just to ask him, and it was really like coming full circle because this was a Hughes Aircraft building. Uh, near the building where Uncle Sam had worked for wow. Hughes Aircraft, because Uncle Sam's uh, career was, uh, you know, uh, working for Hughes. So we went and we told um, um, Kenyon that story, and he said, "For you and for Dorothy, anything. What do you want?" <laughs> and we, j so Sam just just asked him for the building, just asked him for the building. You know? <laughs> Sam's like going like this to me, and I, you know, I just said, "Yeah, I could." Do you think we could, you could give us some space? He goes, how much space do you need? How about this building? And we, you know, we were just thinking of just a few rooms, right? And he goes, you can have the whole building wow. in summer, you know? And you and we said, for free? He goes, oh, yeah, you just have to talk to Asian American Studies and just make sure Asian American Studies uh, co-sponsors it with you. And, and and that's what we did. And, and, then, and then Sam is like going like this. Because he says, well, what else did you need, you know, Dr. Sam said. <laughs> and so I said, uh, well, you know, we usually have a welcome reception. Uh, we, but, you know, it's usually pretty small. It's not, not that big. And he goes, well, how many people are we talking? I said, uh, I think last year we had about.
about a hundred because you know we were in Virginia and, 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 and Sam was like yeah yeah about a hundred right? okay we, we can have it we'll have it right here in my office wow in the dean's office I think 200 or 300 people showed up <laughs> and, and he had to open up, he had to open up more offices uh, but it was a great sport about it uh and, and, and it was a good time um we we had the chumash Indipinos do a um sacred prayer circle ceremony over the books that's right because the uh it, we we thought that uh our members thought that that was sacred indian uh ground before and so the chumash came and i'm telling you just like when we went to morro bay just like when we went to aguinaldo's tomb none of those photographs turned out they were oh, all, they were all wow. blurry because you're not supposed to take photographs of oh. those sacred things wow. and then joni will tell you how she helped me correct all of the or most not all but most of the uh, uh typos and, and errors in the program at the last minute and uh, uh, we did our late night kinko runs which was our tradition since who knows when uh, <laughs> to, to do the addendums and uh, outside our, our window every morning was uh, Titania playing uh, Kaleen Tong to, to wake us up. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then at the banquet, at the banquet, we had Rex Navarrete and Allison yeah. Dela Cruz host the, the MC, the event. And we had Primo Kim yeah. and uh, Theo Gonzalez's band, Bobby right. Bandura, Banduria play uh, live. Um, we also ran out of space at that, at that, um, at that banquet. And um, here, say hi, everybody. Say hi, Corey. And, and, uh, hi, Corey. And yeah, we almost we went, we had to run we went, almost ran out of food. Uh, we we had five people five hundred people registered, but we had way more than that kind of attend because it was wow. the first time we put the schedule on the internet, but we oh. didn't put the rooms <laughs> because Uncle Fred said <laughs> Uncle Fred said membership has its privileges, so our, our crew said don't put the rooms. <laughs> just just put this it was like the the birth of the you know the internet it was the first time yeah, we actually had yeah. a website we actually had a we actually had tech people uh, doing any of that oh one last thing i want to say is the the logo on the top if you scroll down at the top there this logo was done by a local artist and um uncle royal morales was a dear uh mentor to all of us and teacher and a member of our chapter in la and he was supposed to lead the uncle roy tour of los angeles this historic filipino town but he passed away the year before so uh we commissioned the artist to make this logo in honor of uncle roy mm -hmm. his work with the youth and uh his go fly a kite with uncle roy program wow. and his parole instruction program and so we continued that in the um conference where we had a children's uh, track for the first time, children's workshop, kind of like the Camp FYA that we had in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a whole room all day uh, for children's story time, uh, kite making, parole making, and we had different um, educators and authors come into that room so that it would be part of the conference too. And um, uh, that, that was that was really a joy for me. It was before I had kids. <laughs> <laughs> and now, I, I, now I wish we would return to that so I could <laughs> put my kid in that room. Okay, okay. Then we went on to St. Louis Louis. Oh, gosh, that was an interesting conference. Uh, that was, oh, uh, St. It was a, that was an interesting conference because it was by remote control. Uh, it was going to be in St. Louis, um, Missouri. I was in Seattle, and uh, Gil Palapil, the chairperson, was in Illinois. So we worked with uh, the Fonz chapter in uh, St. Louis, which really was not that active, but at least what they did is they got us the site. It was uh, uh, the University of Missouri uh, in St. Louis. It was, it was out in the sticks. We didn't realize where it was because, like I say, nobody had seen it. And when we got there, what was interesting, people start to come in. And uh, I had 
two places to put people housing in the dormitory. And then some of you were, uh, I was able to place you in apartments, the lucky ones, which was, I guess you were walk, you had to walk maybe around 10 minutes uh, to the, to the dorm. But the night we got there, the afternoon that we got there to the dorm, the person in charge, the student in charge of greeting us started to regale us with stories about that building. He told us it was haunted. <laughs> of course, being Filipinos, we took it to heart. He was telling us about how <laughs> and we were all just arguing all over the place and how the person who was down there came out and was never the same anymore. And we, we, it was really a spooky place, but it was, and there were, there were stories. It was interesting. The, the people who came there, we, uh, Tim's play, Heart of the Sun, because it was the St. Louis World's Fair, and which was after the Spanish-American War. And uh, he, he uh, Heart of the Sun came and per did two performances. Uh, we had students all over there. We had, it was like a dichotomy. We had the apartment people who were privileged. And those of us in the dorms who were very hungry because there wasn't any place to eat around that place, we didn't realize we were out in the country and there were no restaurants on there and no one had a car. We had, FY had, I mean, Juan's had one van that we could use. But the night before, the local doctors treated us to a reception at one of their homes. And I don't know if anyone remembers any stories about that, but it was a very hot day again. And uh, someone was there. I think, Alan, you were telling me a story about someone who did a presentation at that place. That was uh, Kevin Nadal. Know. Kevin Nadal uh, was, made his Fawn's debut over at that, over at that ah. place. And uh, he did a one-act play. And uh, that place, it was just so hot. I'm trying yeah. to figure out. Uh, oh, anyway, I'm trying to thumb through some of these pictures. Uh, it, it was a very significant amount of people that were like either 25 and 35. Uh, yeah. Here's a picture of uh, of that group there. Uh, well, I think Alan, it goes back to what you were telling people at the LA conference because you told Abe and Liz from San Jose, "I'll bet you we can bring more young people from the West Coast <laughs> than from the East Coast." <laughs> and I took that to heart. Okay, let me get some people from San Diego. So we brought all these high school kids yeah. from San Diego. Yeah. You guys brought some students from Virginia Beach, and we all met in the middle, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I forgot Uncle about that. There was a challenge. <laughs> yeah. There's Uncle Fred. Um, so at that time, Uncle Fred asked me, Auntie Dorothy asked me to do the registration. So I had to yeah. work out the registration table with all the names. I bootlegged my printer from LA Unified and we printed all these name badges to make sure we had the name. Dr. Palapio somehow lost his wife's badge. And I told him, I didn't bring the printer because I don't want people to think I'm going to correct their name just because they misspelled or whatever. So I had to go back to the apartment that was haunted and get the printer and then print it for him <laughs> and make it look like nothing happened. <laughs> it out. So, yeah, that, that was a. That was another time that everybody had to step in and work uh, yeah. because it was, a, yeah, it was uh, the people in Chicago were far away. It was really when you consider the Midwest, uh, this was in Missouri and most of our people were up in Illinois, upper New, uh, Illinois. So uh, it was a case where we all stepped in to work to help out. It was, and it was good. Uh, what I remember about that, because it was the St. Louis World's Fair, yeah. and the most significant thing at the St. Louis World's Fair was the Igorotic Village, uh, where uh, they were on display. It was, a, it, was a, it was a zoo, a cultural zoo. But that night, there was Alfred Nug uh, uh, Bakdayan, who was a professor uh, in one of the Midwest universities. And he gave a presentation, but he also then, uh, the night of the dance, uh, the evening of the of the last dance, uh, he danced along with a number of the other women. They did yeah. igorote, uh the dances. Right. Then they encouraged those of us who wanted to join in. And I'll never forget, they started, the gongs started to go, and I forget, I think Heart of the Sun people were there. They were with their gongs and everything. And um, all of a sudden, we jumped up, including me, and we danced around. <laughs> Like, like we knew what we were doing, but it was interesting. <laughs> it was 
other people were looking at us like, are you crazy? But we got caught up in the moment. And um, it showed, you know, it was, it was history. Uh, this was the beginning. This is what people, a lot of people didn't understand that wherever there were um, world fairs or whatever, it, it influenced the way the local country perceived Filipino like in Seattle. They, they could, that's what happened in Seattle. We had one here and they thought of us as being not quite civilized people because of the way the Igorots were dressed, not realizing that they had a high culture too. So does anyone else have any stories? I mean, one thing, there were so many young people there, they yeah. had parties almost every night. Yeah, on, on this picture this here. They, the, yeah, they had a good time. Yeah, the reason I took this picture, shared this picture here was uh, a lot of the people there never experienced the coolness of a basement because it was so hot that everybody just ran into the basement. So I took this picture and, and look at everybody just going, what? Yeah, it was it was very, 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 very hot. Uh, let me see if I got one more here. While you're searching, Alan, while we were at the banquet, there was a black wedding that occurred on the third or fourth floor. And our, our conference was at the basement. So I think once the gong started playing, this is the first time black folks saw Filipinos getting down. They'd never seen that before. And outside of the, of the conference, when I would go to the post office, I remember feeling discriminated by some of the black folk who have never seen Filipinos talk back before or do anything. And it, it was just weird being in the Midwest. <laughs> that is true. That is true. OK. Now we go to Honolulu. Okay, no chapter in Honolulu, but we did have uh, Clemente was our trustee, but the person I, I leaned on heavily as soon as we came back from St. Louis was my oldest son, J.R.'s um, Anthony's uh, godmother, uh, Rose Tamundon. And she really worked hard. So we got, she was able to get to secure the hotel uh, for a good price. Uh, that used, that was the hotel that was used in Hawaii Five O, or I guess that's the name of it. And But even though they gave us a good price, they, there was a caveat there. I had to pay, I think, 40000 up front, and, which we didn't have. So she worked out an arrangement where we paid 16000 and then another 12000 And then a week before the thing, we paid it in full. And um, what I had to do is write a letter to the chapters and the trustees and explain the situation that we had to pay up front. And the 16000 believe it or not, by, um, by the end of December, we had the $16,000 ready to pay. It was really interesting. People worked hard in Hawaii. Uh, they set up tours uh, to go to the, we were on Oahu and all the plantations are closed now. So we did tours of old plantations. And um, at first they had one bus for 40 or 50 people. And then so many people would go on the second bus. We ended up with three busloads of people, over 100, around 150 people went on tours. And um, they stopped off at one of the places that was now no longer functioning. But we found out that old Filipino families were still living there. The plantation owners had given them the right to live in their old homes. And they then gave them plots where they raised their own whatever they wanted, whether it was flowers or vegetables or fruits. And they sold them at uh, farmers markets. It was really interesting. It was for many of us were city kids, and to go on the plantation, actual plantation, and kind of see the remnants of how it used to be. Uh, that was, and then Domingo Los Banos brought us to a place that he worked on, uh, where it was um, a, a sort of a miniature plantation of all the different ethnic groups: Japanese, Chinese you know, whatever, and there was a Filipino one and everybody took pictures there. Uh, we ended up at this place that was a great big, uh, a brand new Filipino-American um, community center. And that's where they gave us a, a, a great big welcome dinner. And the, the conferences in and of itself, 
what I remember most specifically were there were good presentations there, but many of us who were struck by two presentations that were done by two jazz artists, and I don't know, um, I, I can't forget, but one of them played with Stan Kenton. They were really, and their workshops were packed because people really wanted to hear these people who were part of the American musical mainstream. And um, so anyone, I mean, Hawaii was just, as usual, I'm busy counting up to see if I'm making, not going to go in the hole, but does anyone else have any other memories besides what I just gave? Yeah, Ronnie, can you go ahead and share your pictures there? Um, I don't have it. I, I don't, um, let me just say this. I remember being on the tour and there were so many people that were in line trying to buy stuff. Auntie Dorothy made me go out there and go get them. So I had to make an announcement to get back on the bus because we're leaving. And people yeah. didn't want to leave. So th that was part of the thing that was there. I I'm going to have to work something out to see if I can get the photos out. And hang on. Okay. All right. Okay. I From also Hawaii. remember helping uh, on the registration, um, printing out all the names even sitting with Auntie Dorothy at the trustees meeting on the banquet list, we can only get what 550 people so we have to make sure that it doesn't exceed the number because the room only holds held so much at the Ilakai. Yeah, we only have a little over, uh, we could only have 500 people, a little under 500. Uh, and yeah, we had to keep, we couldn't hey, uh, sell tickets, Alaska. too many tickets to the local Alaska. Selma um, Buckles passed away. We honored her. Okay. Right before Alaska, Thelma Buckle dies. And so um, we, <laughs> it, was, it was sad. Um, she really wanted this conference. She worked hard to, to get, get it to go to there before, well, who knew, who knows you're going to pass away. So they pulled it off. It was, uh, uh, Tim did the, we worked with them. We, we did all the public from uh, the national office. And uh, they, I think it was the first day, I, first time I ever met EJ. And um, there were good presentations in the very beginning, the first day they had people who were talking about uh, Alaska, and not just about the canneries, because what m many of us in the lower 48 always know about Alaska is just about the salmon canneries. We often forget about the people who live there year round, you know, and the people who are putting on were people living year round, including those who came probably in the late 60s. Okay, here. It's the Hilton, and uh, again, it was due to one of the members was um, the uh, the controller for that particular Hilton. So we got a good rate again. The there were people who came again from all over, and I think Ron, you brought up some people. There were people from Hawaii who came. Uh, it wasn't that large, but it was it was a significant number of people, people who had never come before, uh, like uh, Juanita Smile lot. She and her husband Rob came all the way from Washington D.C., and uh, there was a tour that they took us to uh, a cannery, and they drove us to some of the most beautiful places I'd ever seen, really pristine. And we got to the cannery and there was a, a young white woman who was giving the tour. She was talking about the importance of the salmon cannery up in Alaska. And she mentions Japanese workers and somebody said, well, what about the Filipinos? She didn't know Filipinos worked in the canneries in Alaska and she was doing our tour. And, and I think, I don't know, Ellen, if you were the one who confronted her, but she didn't have a clue. It was really interesting. That shows you, even in a state like Alaska, they didn't know about us. 
Well, I, I think what happened was uh, uh, we were there in, in 2008. When I worked in Alaska, it was in the 70s. And like a lot of the Alaskaros and the Monongs, they were already, you know, kind of, uh, I wouldn't say dying off, but then we were, well, we were getting older and uh, moving on. But they also switched from canned salmon to fresh frozen salmon. And so there was really no need. Uh, the, the days of canning was, was, was numbered. And this was in the 70s. So I, I, I can understand why she, was, she was, didn't know that Filipinos worked there because this is 2008. And a lot of the Malons in the, in the mid 70s, they were already in their 60s. And so they probably, I'm just guessing that they probably start, started to, you know, uh, by the early 90s, they probably weren't, weren't uh, the canning industry was not nearly as, as, as big as, as it was back in, you know, prior to that. And so necessarily a lot of the monarchs never went, uh, there was no need for Filipinos then. And so what they did is they hired locals to do the fresh frozen where they, uh, um, once the salmon comes in, they, they, they have to butcher it and then they, they freeze it instead of canning it. And that's probably why, uh, but the Japanese always had the market on the eggs, the salmon eggs. That was that was their market. And that's why she was familiar with the Japanese and probably why she didn't see mm -hmm. any Filipinos. And uh, the cannery that we visited was actually the I worked across on the other cannery uh, across the river. That's where I worked for 10 summers. And I've always looked at that cannery that we were walking around just from the other side. And uh, yeah, a lot of those memories really brought back. Uh, you know, working in this in, in Alaska, which is, uh, uh, you know, kind of hard. It's, it's hard work, uh, no doubt about it, in terms of, of, uh, of endurance. Um, you had to work like this one stretch for, for two weeks. You're up at six, seven in the morning. You work till midnight, one o'clock in the morning. Now, I was like 18, 19 years old, you know, and I'm going side by side with monos in their 60s. And I was tired. But these monongs, man, they had like another gear. And so like they were, you talk about, you know, resiliency and stuff like that. That's where uh, the monongs taught me, you know, little secrets here and there on, on far as, as far as, uh, you know, how, how to endure, you know, how to focus. And I think that that really developed uh, discipline in me in that, you know, whatever I do, I, I put off, you put your whole effort into it, everything. Nothing is half-assed when, when, when it comes to, when I do something, it's all out. And I learned that from the monos because those guys, ugh, you know, I'll never, I was just so blessed. I'm so grateful of the lessons that I didn't, I didn't even realize they, they were lessons. They were just like a way of life. But uh, that's the reason why she was made that statement. So it's not her fault. You know, she just a little, she, she was kind of young anyway. <laughs> I don't even I don't even think she was born in the 70s. She was probably born in the 80s, but uh it, it, it's 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 all good, you know. Right however, now, you know, no, however she was a and then she should have known. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna forgive her. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> going on you one of the on. things rolling going on. <laughs> Okay, look where we went to after yeah, yeah, yeah. Seattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay so seattle we had a there's our second conference and um one of the things i remember it was very different from the first one that we had where it was only a day and a half this one it was the first time we had a, 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 a we did have a young the, the thing it was the camp fya and so uh giving philip you know, lessons about the cultural things. Uh, uh, there's uh, I teaching the kids things about the, the Kulin tongue. Uh, Allison was there with her group. They, they did some work. It was uh, the Seattle one. We started to bring in, we started to bring in what was happening in Seattle. And I remember it was, um, we started, it was a time then we were encouraging people to talk about the time of martial law. It was more like reaching out the long line. Because that's another story, and uh, which won't be discussed here. And we, what we did, uh, Juan was kind enough to give us get lanyards, these expensive lanyards that he had his uncle bring from the Philippines. 
and uh, were issued to everybody as part of their their lanyards uh, that show that they went to the conference. One thing, and everybody else can pipe in, but one of the things that I remember, it was the most successful author's reception we ever had. Joan May was up on the stage bringing in authors to come and speak and talk about their books. And a camping towers was filled with, I think I had 20 tables, 15 to 20 tables set up for different authors to sell their wares. Everybody sold out. And it was, it was really, it was the first time that it was really an office reception. We even had food and drinks. And um, at the same time, we were having in another place in the on campus uh, a cultural show. And we had people, Thai's group came and they performed, they danced, there was dancing and uh, the instrumentals, the the colantons, everything. There was just, so it was a two kind of, two kinds of things going on, the literary, and then the people who still maintain the culture in the Philippines, which is part of the people who are living here. So uh, all in all, then we had the children's group. It was a mishmash. It was um, volume went out. Okay. So from oh, Seattle. We moved on to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, let's see if we have anybody chiming in here. Go ahead, Ron, you have, you have a few things here to say. Let me just get back to Seattle real quick. I, I, I helped out with the registration just to get the names, the badges and lanyards. So it's not just one conference, it's a multitude of conferences where you learn to figure out how to put things in place for the conference to happen. With Albuquerque, I didn't really get a chance to do registration so much because the Albuquerque people were studying the Seattle conference. They took notes and figured out how to set up their conference the way they did. Um, I didn't get to go on this tour as well as Seattle because in New Mexico, I was again working on other things behind the scenes with Auntie Dorothy. Um, it was so hot there. It was over 100 degrees and very humid. And the altitude was so high that you know, you need to keep drinking water if you're going to be functioning. And at that time, I had a vehicle. So, of course, I was doing all these running around, driving things and picking up things for others throughout the conference. Um, so when, like, Emily or Don Mabalo needed something, I was going to uh, the 24-hour Walmart to get it. When awards, like a, a frame needed to be picked up, I picked up four frames so that Auntie Dorothy um, can have put the certificates in there and present it for them. So there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff that people did. Um, people didn't know that I dropped $3,500 for all or most of the um, merchandise that um, was going to be sold through Ponds National. Because at the time, I didn't have a table. I was running the national table to help Auntie Dorothy sell items for the conference. We had Johnny Itleon there. So I paid for his gas going from LA to um, New Mexico just for him to get there and to present um, about, and talk about his father, Larry Itleon. So, you know, I, I think the New Mexico people had their stuff together and in, in trying to put together a conference. A lot of people did skip it so they could save money for the, for the next conference, for San Diego in 2014. But, you know, it, it had its goods and it had its things that were helpful for people to learn. I don't know what happened to Dorothy. She's still there. Well, go ahead. You, you, got the, you got the floor, Ron. We okay, listen. I, 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 think, I think what it is, too, is a lot of people don't realize all the stuff that goes behind these conferences. And I know that you put in a lot of hours and behind the scene type of activities that uh, I really feel that uh, I know you don't want to share, you know, a lot of stuff that you do. But, you know, we, we need to know what the heck you did. Just like, uh, you know, if you don't say it, then, you know, we'll never know it. And I'm glad that you you you, you are, are, are are sharing what, what you actually, you know, did. Not just Albuquerque, but, you know, just starting back from, uh, what, St. Louis and Seattle. There's a lot of, a lot of work that went behind that uh, that you had to, you know, 
put a, not, not just a lot of time, but you know, yeah, a lot of time because, like you said, when you when you start working on a conference, especially at the at the popularity as our fonts conferences have been having, what the past ten years, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, unfortunately, we don't even have a playbook you know, for whoever's going to host the next conference, but uh, uh, you are very instrumental in, in the success of our conference in that, the, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure that was built on registration and, you know, try to get rooms and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, uh, you're just, uh, you know, like if, if I went to war, you'd be, you'd be right there. You'd be my number one pick, Ron, when I, if, I, if I ever had to do a conference. But, you know, you are, you are well appreciated. And, you know, the insight that you give is, is a tremendous help. And I'm pretty sure when it comes to 2020 Seattle, the 40th anniversary, you know, that's going to be huge. And so uh, hopefully uh, Ron would, would talent and experience and uh, know-how uh, would be utilized. And uh, I think uh, some of the advice is that, that you're going to share, you know, like you got to start uh, planning now. And it's like, uh, when you say planning, uh, you just talk to Ron because you need to have some certain uh, uh, committees on on board, you know, to get that stuff done. So um, uh, while we're waiting for Auntie Dorothy to hook up, did you want to say anything prior, before we say, uh, get on to, to San Diego or? Well, let me just say this, uh, I Pittsburgh? learned, Go ahead. this was the third consecutive conference where my parents were involved or participated you know from the, you know going back the last three including new mexico um seattle and, and alaska i mean i'll go back to alaska you know at the funeral this is where i met quint bacall okay. and okay. our friendship since hey, then Alan, has been can you hear me? because dr b he yeah, go, 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 hold on ron uh yeah. damon's saying something go ahead, yeah, go ahead hey dr b Hey, uh, Ron, sorry for um, interrupting you. Just got no, a call okay. from my mom. I guess her computer is dead. So <laughs> you guys are on your own. Okay, okay. here we go. Okay. Joni and Emily, you got, I hope you're still in the house. <laughs> but uh, We're still here. Okay, good. Yeah. So you can start chiming in. Um, yeah, you're almost at the end anyway. She's yeah. got to charge it. She's got to charge it, Damon. <laughs> got, I, I, just a shout out to uh, Devin Israel Cabanella, who I think is on the call. He uh, donated a, a Google Chromebook and a, a brand new iPad to Auntie wow. Dorothy this month. Wow. So she wow. Can get on to her awesome. Zooms. If you guys haven't noticed, she's really, you know, into it uh, in honor of Filipino American History Month. Uh, she had resisted it for years. And yeah. Uh, just a uh, big thanks to Damien and to Bibiana and Cecilia and all of the Cordova family for helping Auntie Dorothy and and to uh, her extended nephew, uh, Devin, from our Greater Seattle chapter for, for donating the equipment, including big red earphones that she's not wearing. She's, <laughs> she's wearing the little ones. And I think that's that may be an issue, uh, but they need to be charged. Okay. So are we going to move on to San Diego there, Ron? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. I'm sorry, I can't. Um, yeah, I can't lead her to the uh, electric plug in her oh, house. Oh, there you are. Who's that? Who's that? <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Devin. Thank right. you. Okay. Okay. I think Uncle Pete wanted to say something. Go ahead. Uh, Uncle Pete wanted Uncle to say Pete. something about the bridge generation while we're uh, yeah. seeing if Auntie Dorothy get hooked up again. But uh, at this time, uh, Uncle Pete Jamero um, has been a, a founder of Fonz and back in the heyday and uh, was uh, uh, did a lot of work. He's got uh, his, uh, well, what is that called? Not, I wouldn't say a blog. Is it Growing Up Brown or... Is that a website or, but anyway, Uncle Pete would like to share his comments on the bridge generation. Go ahead, Uncle Pete. Conference. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, I want to also thank Dorothy uh, for some of the comments that she made on the bridge generation. <clears throat> but um, you mentioned growing up brown, Alan, that was my first book, but I, I think I'd like to really talk about my second book, which is called Vanishing Filipino Americans, The mm. Bridge Generation. It was entirely obviously on, on the bridge generation. Actually, in looking back, I should have named it instead of 
Vanishing Filipino Americans. I should have named it Forgotten Filipino Americans. As you know, um, I'm a proud member of the Bridge Generation, as is Dorothy, and and uh, as are many of the original members of the the of 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 Fonz back in the old days, and. You know, everybody remembers the Manong generation and its contribution to all of us who followed. But hardly anybody remembers about the bridge generation. Uh, and I, I say that because uh, if you really think about it, the book that I wrote in the early 2000s, Vanishing Filipino Americans, about the bridge generation, it was really a plea for people interested in Filipino American history to follow up and doing the necessary research to, to really find out about our place in Filipino American history. Uh, and uh, obviously I'm a little biased, but I think our generation had much to do with the evolution of uh, Filipino American American history here in the United States. We are the only generation uh, after the Manong generation that did not have the uh, uh, protections, for example, that we now have in civil rights or affirmative action. Another way to put it is our generation went through many of the same horrors that the Manon generation went through. And yet, uh, that's a fact that hardly anybody even uh, knows about today. Uh, but uh, maybe, maybe enough about my, my, my personal bias about the lack of research and the lack of information in our generation. Particularly when you think about it, our generation is not on this earth anymore. Hardly any of us are left. I'm 90 years old. And our generation had people that were born, say, 10 years before me, they're gone. A lot mm -hmm. of, uh, most of the 90 year olds uh, are, are infirm today. 80 year olds, 70 year olds in our generation, some of them are still here, but I tell you, our ranks are rapidly declining. Okay, maybe enough of that. Uh, I would urge all of you who have an interest in how the bridge generation fit into Filipino American history, I would urge you to take a look at what really happened at the 1994 conference. It was very significant in many ways. Dorothy talked about uh, some of that, particularly when she talked about uh, maybe 35 uh, bridge generation Filipino Americans that were honored for their achievements in this country. And, and those who were honored uh, included folks from, from the film industry, from music, from the arts, et cetera, uh, athletics. And uh, I, I think the accomplishments of our generation, particularly when you consider that we had, a, we had uh, all kinds of obstacles in the way of being able to participate fairly in American society. That was big. It was also big, uh, a lot of you mentioned the inclusion of college age young adults in, 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 uh, in funds. Uh, if I remember correctly, the 1994 conference had a very sizable a uh, number of college age students. In fact, they had their own deal. Uh, they got together and, and wanted to make sure that, that they had a chance not only to socialize, but talk about those issues that were of importance to them. Uh, going back a little bit, somebody mentioned uh, comedians. Uh, I think we were the first conference mm -hmm. that featured comedians, uh, some of them were uh, very prominent. Uh, so I think we had a lot of firsts, uh, uh, including the fact that 
we not only uh, paid our bills, we finished sizably in the black, which was, uh, I think, one of the first uh, achievements uh, that, that uh, in, in terms of financially that Fonz uh, was able to achieve. Uh, I could go on and on, but I think I said my piece. And so particular, uh, so just going back to what I started with, the fact that in my uh, in my opinion, I, I think the the part that you devoted to the bridge generation, I think we got short shrift. And um, I should thank you for giving me an opportunity to try to fill in what I considered a sizable uh, vacuum in terms of the time allocated to bridge generation. Thank you for the time. Oh, thank you. Uh uh, could I just weigh in on this too? Um, our generation wasn't isn't only dying, but a lot of people didn't even know we existed. I guess that I am mute again. Well, you're fine. You're fine. Yeah. No, I don't see. Thank you. Uh, she unmuted. You have to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> unmute, Auntie Dorothy. Unmute. I don't know how to do these things? There you am go. I? Yeah, okay. Okay. So. The thing is, and Pete's right, when we started to do the interviews, we were, we was, I started my program, we were interviewing our parents, and a lot of times we weren't even interviewing ourselves, and we were hoping other people would interview us, but they never did, I guess we weren't that interesting, it's just that we, we were, this is what people have to understand, whatever our parents went through, we also went through it. So when we talk about the discrimination, all the horrendous kinds of things that went through, we were part and parcel of the whole thing. And there was another difference is we were also the children who were there when, when discrimination and all the other things were really, really prominent. And we had to deal with it. As, there's my, our generation, the bridge generation, we developed a whole new thing. We had our own social activities. We were Filipino at home and American outside of the home. It was a case where we had, we truly were bridge people. We're bridging two things. Our parents had just come up of 300 years with Spain, become American, and now they were raising children who were born in America and were not considered Americans by the vast majority of Americans here. And because we didn't look like them. And um, Peter's right, there was, we are also the generation who fought for civil rights. And uh, it was our generation who went out there because we remembered how it was and we didn't want it. We remembered how our parents had to suffer, how we had to we experience it. And we all had children during those, those years. And when I talk about activism, we were the generation really that went out there on activism. We butted heads, we swore, we cursed, we cussed. And we weren't just fighting for our parents. We we're fighting then in the 60s and the 70s for the new immigrants who were coming, whole bunch of them, 20,000 a year after a while, 50,000 coming to this country. And I used to wonder, why are you coming? Don't you understand how it is in this country? Uh, Pete went through a lot. We talked about it. Uh, People, you talk about activism, you should, and Pete's right. Our people are dying all the time. Our numbers have diminished every year, right? It's, it's, a, case, it's a part of history that has, is disappearing. Pete's 90. When I first met Pete, he was in his 30s. A lot's been coming. You know, it's, um, and we're still around. There's still, Peter can tell their chapter in Central Central Valley, that's a lot of bridge generation people. There are still maybe here in Seattle, there aren't too many. Chicago, I think they can count on one or two hands. So we're looking for old research. And this is basically what Fonz is about, is to collect the history of people. How did we, as the, pe the bridge generation, how did we perceive living in America? It was different from a lot of you guys, because by the time you were born and coming around, a lot of things that we fought for was there. You didn't have to feel a lot of stuff, affirmative action, a lot of those things, living in whatever neighborhood you wanted to live in. That's right. <laughs> that was not our experience. Not at all. Peter, we were talking about how all the horrendous things that we had to go through, uh, discriminated against in work. 
the glass ceiling was not a glass ceiling for them. It was a closed ceiling, even though we knew that we were just as good, sometimes better. And this is why when we had the FYA, it was really important, the Filipino youth activity, it was important to teach our kids that they were just as good, if not better. And that's why it was important for something as simple as a drill team to win prizes, to give our kids a sense of ability. And all of us working with that youth group, we're all second generation. We're all the bridge generation. So, you know, I'm glad, Peter, that you said that. And, yeah. and those people, they're gone. They're going. We're gone. Right. In a year and a half, I will be 90. You know? You better so, call me Manon. <laughs> <laughs> um, We're all. I, I just wanted to say something before we close on this subject. Uncle Pete, that was really one of the most emotional conferences I've ever been. I brought my mother there, and, you know, the people that were talking were my dad's generation. And it was so emotional, especially on um, the workshop I attended with the uh, Japanese Filipino mixed That's race. right. And, and, and I was That's so right. emotional. You cannot put a book about this experience. I'm glad I went. It was one of the most emotional conference of all time. I'm glad I was able to share it with my sisters and my mom. It was very special. Great conference. Likewise. Well, you know, can I say? Can, can you I know, the Japanese, the Japanese American thing, um, when Fred's book came out, there was a picture and a woman calls me from San Jose and she said, I'm in that picture. I'm the little girl in the picture. Then she tells me a story I'd never heard before. She was, her mother was Japanese. She was, you know, when World War II began, she was sent with her mother to concentrate to the internment camp. She did not know she was full of uh, Japanese. When her mother married her dad, she, they were, her mother was dead. And so when the, the conference came on and she was uh, with the Santa Clara uh, uh, chapter, I, I wrote in and I had told Terry, we're gonna have to have a, a, a thing on Japanese uh, Filipinos. And then I had to beg people to come there was another one where we had to beg people to come and it was very, it was cathartic. Pe young people, bridge generation who belong to Filipino Federation and to tell their stories. Those were stories that can never be told again. And there was, you have to understand, these are things that happen in America. These are Americans happenstance. What I've always tried to tell and we've always told people, Filipino American history is part of American history. It's not history out, out floating around in the atmosphere. It is American history. It's a different concept. It's a different part of the whole American thing. And Peter, I'm glad that you said what you did. Let me add just one other thing. Uh, our generation is the only generation that lived among the Manong generation. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important for younger people to understand. And the Manang generation, right? I'm, I'm <laughs> that, sorry. And the Manang generation, like your mother and my mother, we oh, were, yeah, they were right. there. Yeah, don't forget yeah. the women. Yeah, we lived. <laughs> uh, yes, the Manang, Manang, Manang yeah, generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but I, but I do think Je that it's important to really think about that, because every other generation only knows about it through others or to read about it. We lived mm -hmm. it. We lived it. We, we lived the good times. We lived the bad times. We got evicted. We were refused entry in clubs. We were refused entry in schools. Mm -hmm. We were discriminated against. When I we was were called years old, somebody on the playground wanted to see my tail. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just one example. I could give you dozens of others. We were uh, called brown monkeys. We were called yeah, all were kinds called of names. Yeah. Just like the, the older folks were. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah. The other thing too is, Dorothy. is, uh, is I, I happen to be one of many in our generation that lived in farm labor camps. And I lived among single men who went through all the things that we now only can read about, but I could see it in their faces. I could see it in their eyes. And today, those things still haunt me. So maybe enough of that. 
Can I just quickly add that, uh, Dorothy, since you mentioned Central Valley funds as being, you know, our, our chapter is that bridge generation, that back in 2008, uh, several of our chapter members wrote their own story. And we put out a publication, which was a, a collection of their stories, their American stories. And I think in every one of those stories, and it was hard, I remember that each of the, the chapter members who were Bridge Generation, they, they never told those stories. They never wanted to talk about that they were discriminated when they were in the service. And I think one of the things I'm looking for is hopefully that other chapters begin to find the same bridge generation to share those stories as we did. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can do another sequel to that book before the rest of us are, are all gone. But uh, anyway, thank you, Pete, for, you know, kudos for the bridge generation. Okay, thank you. Bye. That's it. Go ahead, Emily. You wanted to say something? I, I do. I just want to give my love to, to Uncle Pete and to Auntie Dorothy. I think that conference was uh, the con a, a conference where I also sh chair, you, you appointed me to chair the youth track, even though I wasn't yeah. so much a youth anymore. <laughs> but um, it, it was amazing for me because it was really an inter the continuation of the intergenerational conferences that we had been having. Uh, with an emphasis on the bridge generation. My favorite memory was when we were in uh, the big ballroom and the FYA drill team performed. Mm -hmm. And uh, they asked the alumni to come out onto the floor. And I swear there were about 30 of us alumni from all over the country uh, all of your children <laughs> uh, who came out and, uh, you know, took photos and just basked in, 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 in the, the amazing moment that that was. Another time was when Domingo Los Baños rose from the floor yeah, and just started talking as if, as if he so was ciphering I, um, and a whole, a whole, a whole crew of people started circling around uh -huh. Manon Domingo to hear what he was talking about as a first, uh, as a, uh, a veteran of the first Filipino infantry regiment. That's when they were first working on uh, Untold Triumph film. And to me, that was really what stood out for me at that conference. My parents showed up because we had relatives in the area. Uh -huh. But, but it, it was more uh, of a, a huge intergenerational, uh, at, at the largest level we had ever had, yeah. uh, intergenerational that. conference. That, and I thank you and Auntie Terry for allowing us to take part of it. People like uh, Ben de Guzman and Don Mabalan say that that was their first conference and, and they never left. And we always talk about the 1994 and the 1996 conferences where our, 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 where our, our family and our crew were born. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Uh, let's, let's see, where were we at? San Diego, 2014. Okay. Andy Dorothy. I did not go to this conference. So enlighten me, Ron, or those that went to this conference. What was your memorable moment for this conference? Well, I learned from the previous conference that I need to bring young people into the world since I don't have my own. So I brought five middle school kids from LA into this conference. Quint brought some of his students from Alaska and we, we had to teach them how to be part of a conference. So that became the beginning of that uh, relationship. Now, at the time, I was going through a uh, dissertation at 2014, and I told Judy at the time that I can't do the tour. So from March to May, I just wasn't available. And then when I tried to come back to it, it just never happened. So I ended up doing a tour for the kids, and we started it at the Naval Training Center in San Diego. And I started talking about how many of the Filipino U.S. Navy men who entered the, from the Philippines for the first time, this was where they cried, this is where they were homesick, 
This is where they missed their families from the Philippines. This is when they were alone. This is the church that they cried in. This is where they ate. This is where they marched. This is so by utilizing the Naval Training Center as one way. I mean, that was something that did not happen as part of the tour. I had something set up, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to continue it uh, with, with the with the conference. But there were a lot of people that came in and out of that conference. So that. Auntie Dorothy, go ahead and talk about it. Unmute. You have to unmute Auntie Dorothy. Auntie Dorothy, you're muted. All right. Am I muted? Am I okay? Uh, it was a very nice place, um, but we were far away from food places. We didn't have, you either had to have a car or something. Um, what was interesting about, about that was uh, Judy had brought together a very eclectic group of people. I never saw so many Filipino psychologists in my whole life. There were so many of them. And in fact, the, the theme was very um, Kapwa. And I, I didn't understand what that was, but it was it evidently is, it has to do with trust. I don't know, Joni, tell me what it means. So anyway, it was, it was, the, the keynote speaker uh, explained the thing, and I remember one of my sons now is um, is now <laughs> a protege of that lady because he feels that that's his life standing. So really encourage him. What he could talk me though was General Takuba showed up, and his whole thing was to get funds to sponsor uh, and to take part or to be part of the coalition to push. Um, some kind of recognition medals for the Filipinos who served in the during World War II on Bataan Corregidor. And I'm sitting there on the podium and I'm thinking, well, what about the first and second Filipino infantry? They were part of the Second World War II, you know, also. So I, when I gave it, I said, well, I, I called attention to that. And like everybody was telling me, don't do that. He's a general. And I thought, no, what the heck? Uh, if we part of World War II also. And uh, after that, I have to give to Cuba credit. He went back to his committee and they did after that include the first and second Filipino infantry as part of the people who would be receiving um, the medals that they, they got. And that includes uh, your uncles, your fathers, whatever. And um, the the thing that I also remember is there was a guy helping Judy all the time during this conference, carrying all of this equipment because in hotels you can't, you, we can't purchase all the audio visual stuff. He was pushing things all the way around. I found out he was a retired uh, uh, principal, of one of the schools. And it turned out, I kept saying to Judy, I think this guy likes you. And it turned out to be they got married a few years later, a couple of years later. It was this man worked his off for Judy on that conference. It was, was an interesting place to have a conference at a um, resort. And that's what it was. It was a resort. And it was the first conference that I went to where I didn't have Fred. He had died the year before. So... I know other people have other things to say about San Diego. It was one where we were fed well, thanks to Judy's working out the arrangement for the meal. Any other I'll, comments? I'll say a little bit about San Diego. I almost didn't want to go because I felt like I'd already gone to Uncle Fred's funeral and I didn't want to go to another, a conference and he wasn't there. Uh -huh. And then Emily convinced me to go, and so did Fran Alayu Womack. Fran told me, Joni, it's, it might be my last conference, and it really it was. was. It yeah. was. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had this dream of Uncle Fred that was on, he was on a panel with us, and Don <laughs> said that if I didn't go, then, then I'd have worse than just a dream of him on the panel. <laughs> No, but it was a it was a good conference, and some highlights were Marissa Arroy showed Delino Monos in a plenary session, 
and she said she did this, you know, she really wanted Bonds as an audience and we gave her a total standing ovation. And that was a magical, a ma magical moment. Also, there was this panel that Cut and Candy and the others, their, their book on hip hop had just come out. And so there was this med major panel on it and it was very inter intergenerational. Auntie Dorothy, your sister, um, <laughs> your sister told, told the group that now I understand my grandchildren better. <laughs> um, it was a really, it, so there were moments like that. And I know New York was taking notes, planning and it was a beautiful resort and that's where Judy and Herb had their wedding reception. <laughs> year later yeah yeah can I add uh, yes go ahead I, go for it um I had just had a baby <laughs> uh, yeah uh three three months before or four months before I, I three months before I had had a baby and I almost didn't go either for the same reasons as Joni and, and we said we better go because we <laughs> I hadn't missed a conference and I could just hear Uncle Fred pulling my toe in the middle of the night saying, you better go or I'll haunt you. And um, <laughs> we we went and what was amazing was Judy had asked uh, Meg Thornton to facilitate the memorial for Uncle Fred. Uh, we had a, uh, instead of a welcome reception or, or after the welcome tour or whatever, we had a memorial for Uncle Fred. And she asked uh, Meg Thornton to do it of our LA chapter because Meg is from National City, from San Diego, and her brother is a minister. And um, and and Judy felt that um, Meg knew Uncle Fred and and trusted her to put together a good um, uh, tribute to Uncle Fred. And I think folks were worried that the whole conference would be a downer without Uncle Fred because we were starting with a, a memorial, a tribute. But instead what it was was a what was a it was a beautiful uh, reminder of why we have fawns, why we gather every two years, why we do the research. And uh, Julius uh, went off the call, but he had organized Fred talks in memory of Uncle Fred and Auntie Dorothy and Luna and others told beautiful stories. Um, he called it Filipinos revolutionizing education and dialogue. And they were like TED talks, except they were called Fred talks. And we want to revitalize or revive that uh, everybody in the room uh, told a story that was amazing and they recorded it on video. And his sister, uh, Tess Paras, who's now a really well-known actress and producer, film producer, she helped facilitate uh, that workshop, um, which was amazing. The other workshop that stood out for me was the Navy workshop that Ron and the others had worked on because we, we, we had... Navy families from East Coast, West Coast, uh, Northwest, all kind of together. That that was great. And to be in a naval city at that moment. Thank you. Well, I think also too, that because it was San Diego, I, I had my parents, my family, my cousin helping, you know, cook food. So at our Fonz LA vendor table, I had, I snuck in 11 trays of babinka. And if you bought three items or more, you get free babinka. If you bought five items or more, you get free pianono that my auntie Lita, I paid her $50 to make two rolls. So we, we, we tried to do some things, but again, the venue was very far. Most people who live in San Diego, they don't, don't go to that resort. It's too far. It's half an hour away from where most of the families live. But, you know, at, also I was a driver too. So I was, picking up Auntie Dorothy, Marissa Roy at the airport, dropping people off. So my that aunties continued. From Detroit. You picked up yeah. my aunties from Detroit. Yeah, because they were uh, stranded. And so I said, look, you better come on because I have room in the van. 
and we're going all over the city on our own personal tour and we're going to feed you at my mom's house so <laughs> they ended up coming um your your friends um your aunties from detroit emily and that was a good treat for them because that was the first time they were able to get out of that area of of where the conference was otherwise you wouldn't have any food or or a place to eat or to go so um and then again i think having more young people there i mean I had middle school kids. I didn't have high school kids, but it was neat to see them with their eyes open, seeing them at a Fawns conference for the first time. It was nice having that. Okay. And then we went up to New York. For New York, I had some of the same students. I had. Um, five kids there. One of them was an adult, but uh, she was also still one of my former students. We met up with Alaska. Quint brought some of his students. Um, Uncle Saul brought two, uh, his granddaughter. So we had students from three different localities. We went there three days in advance and took them everywhere. But, you know, when you're in a big city, you got to make sure that you take care of things that are there. So we had a $10,000 budget where we funded the students to make sure we had hotel, plane tickets, and that sort of thing. And just to be able to, what we had, uh, the banquet was on a riverboat. So Joe Bataan was playing music. It was neat having, having to be around so many different people. And even to go to a Broadway musical, uh, we brought the kids to watch Phantom of the Opera. And a lot of them were starstruck in meeting the lead uh, actress that was there. Dorothy? Yeah, the, that was, um, Kevin brought together a different group of people, which was really exciting. Uh, all these young people in the arts uh, and telling their stories and how they started. And I missed the first session because there was a meeting of Juan's uh, trustees gathering upstairs. And by the time I came down, my sister came, they said, Oh, you missed something really wonderful. All these people telling these wonderful stories about being in plays and starting the whole thing. And that's when I met Joe Baton again for the second time. It's funny. I'd met him once before in Seattle, but he remembered because we were doing the, the history. He's, I would say if we ever do anything in Seattle, it would be really great to have Joe Baton who is bridge generation. And uh, he was, yeah, uh, I mean, younger bridge generation, but nonetheless, hopefully, or, or almost bridge generation, because all the other musicians pretty much have passed away. So uh, there, yeah, Mel was still the president. Judy became the president after that. Uh, Kevin was able to get the university because he's an uh, administrator there. He teaches, professor there. And he also was head of some de the, the, a department. So we got the university for a relatively inexpensive cost, of probably almost next to nothing. Uh, we were housed in two, basically in two hotels uh, within walking distance. And one of the things I remember is Australia Olimar, who was undergoing chemotherapy, uh, told me around two, a week before the conference that she wouldn't be able to make it because she just completed her chemo. She shows up. She's in a hotel. And every morning I would see her with her walker walking slowly from the hotel to the conference site. And <laughs> you talk about dedicated people to the cause. I give her an A plus and maybe a medal. I mean, that was amazing to me. Oh, yeah, the river boat was good. Uh, I don't know, Emily, if you're still there, can you tell how you guys talked to uh, Prince Charming into doing the box social? <laughs> yeah, that was a, one of the best moments in my life on the <laughs> dance floor. I got to dance with yeah. Prince Charming. Uh, Kevin came up with this amazing idea of Paolo Monteblan, who played uh, Prince Charming with Brandy on the big screen, uh, agreed to be a speaker at the conference. And Kevin was kind of joking with him, or I, I don't know if he was, if I was part of it or, or, or Don was part of it, but we were joking. And wouldn't it be amazing if he did a money dance? 
at the banquet because yeah. he was going to <laughs> sing at the banquet. And ding, 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 Kevin was so entre entrepreneurial and gay. Uh, he, he's like, why not? <laughs> right? Uh, he said, yeah, who, who can, let's ask him. And he was a great sport. Uh, he was yeah. already friends with uh, Don and with Allison. And so uh, that helped. And, and there were other Broadway actors who were already friends with uh, them too because of uh, the Magna Rubio play and because of Mahalaya, the, uh, Allison's daughter. So he agreed, and the, the, the only regret we had is that we didn't have the square. We didn't have the credit card square to, <laughs> to uh, swipe pe people's donations. We, we just took uh, cash, uh, but, but that, that was great. And he even danced with the men, women, and children. So uh, we want to do it again at the next conference. Maybe one of y'all can volunteer to be the Prince Charming. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Al, Al, that Alan, was a Al, Alan should be the <laughs> Prince Charming. <laughs> yeah, you actually, I was I was really amused watching all of the the young the the female trustees in line eagerly waiting to dance. Listen, you guys. It was it was your highlight of the day. I think I was sure. Um, it was different um, to go out in the harbor, and I kept looking for the Statue of Liberty, and I think I almost missed it. But because there was so much going on around all all that place, but it showed that we don't have to be, you know. Cal I mean, it seems like New York was a place where we didn't have the dinner in the traditional places, first Chinatown and then on a boat. So maybe when we come to Seattle, we should think of something different. I don't know. Uh, my uh, favorite moment is when they did the reenactment of War's Code. I mean, they had like, oh, yeah. actual lawyers on yeah. both sides and they uh, enacted uh, what happened. Because like uh, with War's Code, uh, which is kind of, you know, dear to my heart being an Alaskaro and, and seeing a good friends, you know, pass away because of that, you know, Sylvia Domingo and Jean Viernes and uh, the way the strategy of, of the New England fisheries versus the, uh, the, the, the Pinoys and they, they just dragged it out in, 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 in the court. And so it's uh, the way they portrayed it, though, was really, really cool, <laughs> you know, and uh, I just uh, wish I recorded the doggone thing because that's uh, that was that was for me that was my uh, magical moment I from, think, from New I, York. I think they did record it. Uh, that, that was the Filipino American uh, Lawyers Association. It was it was good. And the way they got that was through Julia Markley, mm. uh, Manang Lourdes's daughter, who was an active yes, part of, right. of um, the uh, association. Uh, so we hope they could do it again. Yeah, well, it's got to be in 2020, right? Seattle, Ward's Cove? 22. Two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm getting Zoom fatigue from this session. I forgot where I was. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to start. Uh, we're going to uh, Chicago I now. To I just wanted to say that was the first workshop in New York that we used WOVA. So everything was paperless. Oh, yeah. Wo what was it called? Was, um, WOVA. That was really... I mean, it, it was an app for the program. Oh, Uva, yeah. Uva, wow. Uva, Uva app. That which was they're amazing. looking into using for uh, Seattle. Wow. It was very useful. And between yeah. New York and San Diego, which were the only conferences I could afford, my only concept of conferences is that they're luxurious and entertaining. <laughs> so I have no concept <laughs> outside of New York and San Diego. That's what I expect. <laughs> You needed to go to Virginia Beach and climb up on the bunk bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> swim in the pool at the Marriott, huh, Joni? Yeah. Okay, let's move on to Chicago. Chicago was interesting. Uh, I never nice got one. so many. Uh, I never got so many comments. My, I got phone calls, got emails. And uh, actually, the, 
there were two women who were chairing. One had never gone to a conference, a Fonz conference ever. And she had her own concept of what it should be. The other one had gone, but she was a member. As it turned out that most of the people running the conference were all members of NAFA. And so they were going to make at least some, maybe not the, the conference per se, but extraneous things in the image and likeness of the way not was um there were a lot of complaints from people and i think some of them probably was warranted but probably not so much because we're family we shouldn't be complaining you know like all the other times something was there we'd step in and help one thing i i always want to say is uh i felt it was a hero was our trustee who was there ed brought who received so many comments that were negative and just bore it. And that man, he and his wife were 24 seven, never complained. And after the conference is over, came up and apologized to me profusely for failing bonds. And I just looked at him and I said, no, there was a conference, you know, regardless of whatever, there was a conference and some good things came out of it. And the best one of the best things that came out of it is Claire Miranda came after she'd been working uh, with us on the West Coast and she brought her trailer for the uh, documentary she wants to eventually have. And she showed the film early on Saturday morning. There must have been I was surprised when I didn't realize how many people would come. And after she showed that really touching trailer that was the beginning of her documentary, she told me to stand up and say something. I turned around, I was crying. And I turned around and I looked at the people, and almost everyone in the room, including the men, were crying. It had touched us. It was really, it showed me that the history of the old timers really even touched people who probably came just yesterday and who were much younger, didn't even never experience anything like that. So to me, there were there were wonderful things that came out of that that conference uh for probably the most important thing is it was again a gathering but this is what the bonds conference had become they were like family reunions where people got met together every two years people who never knew each other five years ago 10 years ago 20 years ago and now look forward to going to these conferences in different cities or people who had some research that they'd been studying, uh, you know, doing, and had a podium, a podium to share their research with a bunch of other people, and that's the essence of the conferences. The conferences were those of us who weren't necessarily academics were given the right or the podium or the ability to share what we were doing, and I think when all of us are gone, and if we continue on, they're going to see the research that was collected in all of these different conferences, because hopefully, I know they were documented in the first 10 conferences, but um, good, solid Filipino-American history has come out of the conferences. And um, so I'm grateful for the people in Chicago that despite the problems, that came in a lot of, apparently we were boycotted by some young scholars who I don't know, uh, who didn't think we were worth anything. That's those, okay. Those were my friends, I'm sorry, Andy Dorothy. Good stuff. And what we did was, instead of me giving my talk, I turned, I asked around 26, 25 people to speak one or two minutes. Huh? Okay, Filipino American History 101. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Filipino American History 101, there were 20 plus people. I asked to speak for one and a half minutes or two on the specific part of their own particular history. And so in around 35 minutes or so, so maybe 45 minutes, we gave the people who were there and a lot of them on the panel with me were people from the Philippines who didn't give a hoot about this, apparently. Because they couldn't, yeah. they were not impressed with what yeah. we were saying. And, and uh, but you guys did, many of you were on the group who talked about your own specific 
your family's own specific place in Filipino American history in one and a half minutes. So it was like, um, it was a quickie, but I'm glad that we did that because I was hoping those dignitaries from the Philippines would have heard the history right from the people who experienced it. That was a brilliant plenary. Um, and I videotaped some of it and we put it up on social media and it got really, really a lot of views. That was just, and I kept pushing that program committee. Auntie Dorothy needs a plenary. Auntie Dorothy needs the whole plenary. She needs the whole time. Um, and it was also something about these conferences and I realized it more after Chicago, we always lose someone in between conferences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was Dawn's last, and who we would never have imagined that uh, that would have been her last conference. That's right. Um, and the workshops, despite the fact that there was no written program, there were really good workshops. There um, were, yeah. There were from all over. And I remember um, Claire because I missed that in the morning because I was entertaining Fonz Philly. But Claire and I became friends and she, I, we met up in Quezon City a couple of times and she gave me links to her, her stuff. And I remember meeting with all the filmmakers and Auntie Dorothy, they said, you're an example of a decolonized mind of a Filipino that's never <laughs> been colonized. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to hear you say more about that because we're going to write it up as a theory by Auntie Dorothy. Huh. <laughs> Maybe he's going to have to struggle who, I, uh, who the hell I am. <laughs> um, actually, <laughs> when I look back at all the conferences and all the people, I look at you, you know, and I'm closing my eyes and remembering how young we were back in 19... What was it, 1987? One thing I have to say, going all the way back to the first one, it was, a, uh, it was just a day and a half. I forgot to say that the dinner that we had, Terry Jamero cooked it because she had visitors, relatives coming in from California, and she wondered if we could parlay the, the thing that she had for her relatives in in coordination with what we had for the conference. Uh, it was, when we think about the conference, we were growing as we were going along. But the one thing that was always there where we were going to be sharing something that wasn't heard many, almost never, that was the history of us being in the country, in this country, as part of this country. And we just, it was like a snowball, you know, you start up on a mountain, there's a little tiny one that starts rolling down bigger and bigger. And hopefully it doesn't explode and break. It shatters into pieces that just keep rolling. I've always been grateful to everybody who became uh, the chair of a conference. I mean, it, when you think about the responsibility you have to chair something like that, you have to house people. You have to make sure that the people are taken care of that they're going to get there and you're crossing your fingers that everyone will show up. And when it happens and you know, that's the time, the dinner, that's why the dinners were good because it gave us a chance to say, Hey, we made it. We did it. It was always a good feeling. And, you know, I used to make lists of everybody who went to the conferences. I kind of lost track of it after Fred died. He wasn't asking people for the list of the attendees. But up until the time I had, there were over around 1,500, 16 different people, 1,600 different people who attended one or maybe all of the conferences. And I dare say if I had gathered up the names from the subsequent ones, we probably would have been up to over 2,000. Some of them came once, but many of them. And what, one of the things, the conferences, I think helped spur people to write books because people were sharing stories and then the author's reception, people were, the few people were brave enough to put up their first few books. They thought, well, if they could do it, I can do it also. And then they found that people will buy it. Okay, um, one more, 
was Honolulu. Can you hear me, Alan? Oh, there you are. Okay. Yes. Please turn on your camera. Yeah, turn on your camera so we can see you too. Who? Okay. Patricia Brown, Brown is on. <laughs> Go ahead, Patricia. I think she's uh, putting on her makeup. But Ron, you could chime in on this while uh, Patricia yeah. gets her stuff together. I think um, after attending multiple conferences and helping Uncle Fred and Auntie Dorothy with registration, going back to Seattle or no, going back to the Virginia Beach 2000, I mean, I was watching everything to understand. And Dr. Patricia Brown asked me if I would help. So I said, okay, I'll help. And we, you know, we met two and a half years before the conference just to create a registration um, process. And then from there, I mean, I, I ended up helping her with every committee on setting it up and creating a plan for this is how we're going to do marketing. This is how we're going to do registration. Here's our calendar. Here's this. She had a wonderful venue picked out um, across the street from Waikiki Beach. And it was, you know, I mean, of course, unfortunately, we, don't, we weren't able to hold the conference, but so much work had gone into planning each committee, silent auction to just everything. And unfortunately, it just wasn't, it didn't happen, you know, and, you know, but, you know, a lot of it had to do with Patricia Brown and what she did to kind of um, help put it together, just like what Auntie Dorothy was saying, is that you need this go-to person who's going to kind of put it all together and, and make sure that it works. I mean, I'll, I will say this, is that from what happened in Chicago, when we had to deal with a certain individual who was preying on some young women, you know, we, we, we were thinking about, okay, how are we going to handle this if something like this happens? So, you know, I ended up getting my, my guru to want to not only participate, but also to present. And I would pay for his flight, his registration, his meal, his hotel. I mean, it was a $3,500 budget, but we were going to include some Filipino martial artists to be within the conference so that in case we need some protection or some help, we got some stick fighters because I didn't want to be the only one, but that was one feature that we were going to, uh, you know, include as part of the Hawaii conference. So, um, I don't know. I mean, again, there, there was a lot of things that we were trying to make, you know, to make sure it worked. This was the first time we were going to use Google Docs as a, a, a way to feature payment or, or post information. I went through several different types of ways to pay. Are we going to do it online? Is it going to be by credit card? Is it going to be by PayPal? So we end up getting a PayPal account. We end up getting developing email addresses, multiple Gmail accounts just to store because if you go over 15 gigabytes, then it's not free anymore. So we we'll end up paying $1.99 a month. Um, I, still, I still don't see uh, Patricia Brown. Maybe she got knocked out of the, of the Zoom. Well, Auntie Dorothy, did you want to jump in? I'll just go ahead and just uh, stop share. We'll just uh, hang out here. Where's Auntie Dorothy? <laughs> okay. Yes, on mute. Well, just to kind of conclude uh, our 18 conferences and almost our 19th in, in Hawaii. It's a lot of conferences, a lot of years. Yeah. Uh, and we still got a long ways to go, like Uncle Pete, you know, brought up. We got a whole... Yeah generation there that that is uh, uh voiceless not when we say voiceless and just say that it's been silent and that uh perhaps when we start thinking about seattle that we have to revisit a lot of the stories that that that, that need to be told and Ret keep that in retold mind. yeah mm -hmm. keep that in mind for seattle to have a, a track there or you know other ways that uh, uncle pete you could suggest other ways to get the word out and you know, that kind of stuff. But uh, as for me, I was really, really, I still feel the, the missing Uncle Fred. Uh, 
is just uh, so so heartbreaking, you know, for 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 me to get get over, you know, what happened, and he never got a chance to see the Seahawks win a Super Bowl <laughs> after all those years. But uh, it's it's just um, you know I'm starting to get back into it. Um, I was kind of lost as far as getting my energy back, my focus back, and you know, get back into Fawns per se, but uh, uh, I guess this Fawns Zoom thing is really a reawakening in my spirit because this is a new venue where uh, I'm able to reach out and reconnect. Like I haven't seen Uncle Pete in a while. I've seen him now in two sessions, <laughs> right, Uncle Pete? And Auntie Dorothy, you are mastering Zoom real quick. No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> This is a this is a, a almost like a second win, as far as I'm concerned. That uh, another way to reach out, you know, to get the word out, and um, mm -hmm. I think that each and other, you know, we've had we've made mistakes, okay, but that's how we learn. Okay? Oh no, they were all good. I think the mistakes. I don't think they're mistakes. I think they're learning. It's a part of the learning process. Sure, absolutely, just, absolutely. Yeah. We're still yeah. in the game, folks. We're still in the game. Yeah. I think we're starting to get our second win 